Good afternoon, everyone, and the first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 13442 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on protecting employee rights and access to justice. I'd invite all members who wish to take part in this debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And can I remind members that for the purposes of the standing order rule on sub judice, no mention should be made of any live cases during this debate. I now call on Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary for Fair Work, part of my role is to ensure that Scotland takes a progressive approach in the area of employment rights, something we're absolutely committed to doing. This is a difficult task because, of course, we don't have powers over employment law. Instead, we have to contend with a Conservative government in Westminster that is pursuing a regressive, corrosive and oppressive approach to employee rights. So today I want to set out our opposition to the gradual erosion we have seen of employee rights under the last UK government, an erosion that looks set to accelerate in the coming years. I believe that the majority of members will have grave concerns about the direction of travel. <laughs> of course. Neil Finlay. While she's setting out her opposition to that, and, and I am sure we will join in with that, could she set out her vision for what the Scottish Government would do if there was the further devolution of any employment rights? Oh, well, if the member would allow me to get more than two sentences into my speech, he may hear things uh, that he's happy about. Um, because I actually do believe that the majority of members will have grave concerns about the direction of travel. Uh, it's therefore helpful uh, to discuss what can be done to address this and to, protect, to try and protect the rights of workers in Scotland. Now, the central purpose of this government is to grow Scotland's economy. Scotland's economic strategy set out our belief that boosting economic growth and tackling inequality must go hand in hand if we are to succeed. Just last week, the ONS Economic Review highlighted the continuing downward trend in the number of quality jobs, and that contributes to weak productivity growth. I agree entirely with the TUC's General Secretary's comments that this shows that the Chancellor's plan is failing. The current growth is based on a low-pay economy that is unsustainable in the long term, and a UK government committed to huge austerity and further cuts is only going to worsen this situation. So that's why we will continue to oppose spending reductions of the scale and speed that the UK government has suggested. These would slow economic recovery and make deficit reduction more difficult, something shown by the impact of the cuts imposed after 2010. And it is also why we are committed to seeking greater powers uh, for Scotland. First, by ensuring that the recommendations of the Smith Commission are met in full, and then by making a clear case for additional responsibilities beyond those which the Smith Commission identified. In particular, powers over business taxes, employment law, the minimum wage, health and safety and welfare would enable us to create good quality jobs, grow the economy and lift people out of poverty. Now, one of the things we know we will get responsibility for through the Scotland Bill is likely to be employment tribunals. These are a perfect example of where decisions made in Westminster are failing workers in Scotland. With our new powers, we must maximise the opportunities to reintroduce fairness and justice for employees affected by bad employment. The previous UK government pursued an employment review programme which resulted in the slow dismantling of employee rights built up over many decades. The coalition increased the qualifying period for making a claim at a tribunal from one year to two years in employment for the majority of cases. Despite Scottish Government opposition, they introduced fees for making a claim at an employment tribunal uh, in July 2013, fees which ranged from £390 to £1,200 for an employee to raise a claim, while the employer paid no fee. Hugh Henry. Could you clarify, does the Scottish Government have the power to alter or reduce the tribunal fees? Uh, not at Cameron present, uh, is my understanding, and I'm going to come on to issues that are connected with fees, uh, because the introduction of the fees for employment tribunals, which of course are currently entirely reserved, uh, has had a dramatic impact in Scotland. The number of single claims received in Scotland from January to June 2013 was 
2,118, whereas the number for the same period in 2014, after the fees were introduced, was 880. That marks a reduction of almost 60% in single claims in Scotland. An area of particular concern is the drop in certain categories of case, for example, unlawful deduction of wages claims, reduced by 71.5%, and sex discrimination cases declined by 83%. This has been compounded by the fact that only 49% of those successful at tribunal receive payment in full from the employer. Now, there's a mounting body of evidence detailing the adverse effects of this discriminatory legisl legislation, backed up by research by Citizens Advice Scotland and Strathclyde University, entitled The Price of Justice. There can be no doubt this is an appalling state of affairs whereby long-fought-for protections in law are made meaningless as the vulnerable and those in most need are priced out of access to justice. The potential transfer of powers in the Scotland Bill gives us an opportunity to consult on new and innovative ways to ensure that employees are supported through the system and ensure they get the money they are awarded. I will be looking to employers, employees and experts in this field and to assess the impact of the fees and to look at new ways to improve fairness uh, at work. We are committed to the principle of abolishing fees for employment tribunals, but we must be absolutely clear on how the transfer of powers and responsibilities would work before we commit to a timescale uh, for this. Now, the importance of employment rights must not be understated. They serve not only to protect the opportunity and dignity of individual employees, but strengthen our workforce, workplaces and economy as a whole. They are fundamental protections and liberties and enrich democracy across the country. Joining a trade union seeking to protect your rights at work and yes, in some circumstances, withdrawing your labour are not only a part of these rights, they are key to safeguarding them. However, the Conservative government in Westminster is proposing to further restrict these rights, particularly the right to strike with the introduction of the Trades Union Unions Bill. This bill aims to bring about highly regressive reforms, making it more difficult for employees to have their voice heard. We oppose the measures set out in this bill to further restrict the right to strike. Instead of helping unions to ballot more effectively on strike action through measures such as online voting, it will impose a 50% turnout threshold on strike ballots. Far from increasing turnout and democratising the ballot system, this legislation will serve only to make it almost impossible for union members to withdraw their labour and will serve only to suppress and inhibit the capabilities of organised labour. Indeed, as STUC General Secretary Graham Smith rightly pointed out on 27th May, if the same rules were to apply to the UK general elections, David Cameron himself would be unable to govern. These measures will impose even greater restrictions on employees and certain essential public services, such as health, education, fire and transport. And these are areas where the dedication and commitment of employees should be recognised and applauded. Instead, to sanction and restrict their trade union rights does them a great this service. We believe that trade unions are key social partners, playing an important role in sustaining effective democracy in society, particularly in the workplace, and that the existence of the good employment practices they promote are a key contributor to economic competitiveness and social justice. Our memorandum of understanding with the STUC demonstrates our commitment to work inclusively and productively with all key social partners. And we will continue to work with them alongside employers to ensure that we continue to build sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And one example of that, of course, is our establishment of the Fair Work Convention. It brings together trade unions, the private sector and the wider public sector. It aims to encourage workforce policies which encourage innovation, higher productivity and better workforce engagement. It is through positive action and constructive relationships like these uh, that we can create a fairer workplace instead of punitively, regressively and unproductively restricting the right of union members to take industrial action. Let us be very clear. Attacks on the rights of our workforce will be bad for individuals, bad for our economy and bad for democracy in our country. So these are just two reasons why we believe that employment law should be devolved to Scotland, so that we can both protect the rights of employees and continue to build sustainable economic growth. Over the past year, 
we have made great steps towards improving fairness, democracy, dialogue, productivity and innovation in our workplaces. And of course there is more to be done about making sure those in work are fairly rewarded. The First Minister last week met with key industry bodies as part of a living wage summit. The living wage is one of these policies that virtually everyone accepts as being desirable in principle. And the agreement that the living wage is the right thing to do is already taking hold in Scotland. The number of Scottish-based living wage accredited employers has grown from 30 this time last year to more than 200. Scotland now has approximately 13% of the accredited employers in the UK, significantly more than our population share. In addition, 81% of Scottish employees are paid at least the living wage compared to 78% across the UK as a whole. So what the Scottish Government is trying to do, in addition to leading by example through our own living wage accreditation, is to promote and share some of the experiences of employers who now pay the living wage. So the living wage is increasingly seen by both society and employers as the norm. With powers over the minimum wage, we could accelerate the progress of bringing everyone up to this level. Of course, we will also focus our efforts on those seeking work. We already deliver a range of employability support services in Scotland. With the devolution of employability support services, I propose to build on the strengths of the employability delivery landscape in Scotland. It's an opportunity to develop our Scottish approach, reflecting our core aims of sustainable economic growth, inclusion, fair work and social justice, supporting those seeking work and those in work to have access to quality job opportunities. There is, presiding officer, a lot that has been done. There is, however, a lot still to do, uh, and this government is uh, determined to do it. The approach that we're taking is in line with a growing international consensus, supported by the IMF, the OECD and many others, that prosperity and fairness aren't in opposition to each other. They reinforce each other. They are two sides of the same coin. Creating a more equal society will help us to become more competitive. If I could turn briefly to the amendments before I close, presiding officer, we will not be accepting either of them. There is a clear line in the sand between uh, what the Conservative government in Westminster intends and what we could ever agree to. So it probably will come as no surprise to hear that I won't be accepting the amendment in the name of Alec Johnson. As for the Labour Amendment, all I can say is that it is a missed opportunity to forge a joint approach between us. About a third of the demands don't even relate to my responsibilities in my own portfolio. Perhaps instead of posturing they had come forward with something constructive, I might have been able to accept it, but that's not going to happen today. And, presiding officer, clearly the amendment that I've seen uh, has a typo in it because it's missing the line that talks about the devolution of employment law particularly uh, to Scotland uh, which would be essential to satisfy most of the demands uh, that were within the amendment. So presiding officer to deliver what we need in the area of employment rights we do need greater powers for Scotland. Powers to protect the rights of employees and deliver more progressive employment legislation that supports innovation productivity and justice in the workplace and indeed that has all been called for by the STUC. So today I move the motion and I hope that colleagues in the chamber will be able to support it. Many thanks. I now call on Siobhan McMahon to speak to and move amendment 13442.2. Uh, Ms McMahon you have um, 10 minutes or thereby please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in the debate this afternoon. As I've stated in our amendment, Scottish Labour welcomes the wide-ranging debate that is currently taking place regarding the pro and cons of devolving employment law to Scotland and the impact that may have on the lives of working people. We are keen to take part in these discussions, but we recognise the issue is far from black and white. As we have stated in our amendment, there are wide-ranging views held within the trade union movement on this issue and we would be interested to take part in discussions where those views are being heard and listened to. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that we pledged in our workplace manifesto for this year's general election that we would establish a Scottish Hazard Centre. Although this is a pledge we will clearly not be able to deliver, I am delighted that the health and safety charity, Scottish Hazards, 
has launched a funding appeal to make this ambition a reality. The centre will provide support, advice and training on a wide range of health and safety issues. The theme of this year's International Workers' Day Memorial was removing exposure to hazardous substances in the workplace. This centre would be fitting, a fitting way to honour that theme. It is an atrocious fact that every year more people are killed at work than in wars. Currently, an estimated 132 people die in Scotland in work-related incidents. That is why the appeal is supported by these benches and the STUC. Yes. Neil Finlay. I wonder if she's aware that in my region uh, last week, a, a Romanian uh, migrant worker was killed uh, on a, a site and that actually the Scottish Hazard Centre is exactly the type of place that would be able to get information out to people like that who are not represented by a trade union. OK, Siobhan McMahon. Yeah, I do recognise that. And um, when, I, when I was drafting this part of my speech, the thoughts um, were with that um, member and obviously the thoughts of, of, I presume, the full chamber will be with the family at this time. Um, and as I said, I hope that the Scottish Government will also support this appeal and pledge not only their vocal backing, but much needed financial backing. There are many pay disputes and other work-related disputes happening across Scotland on a daily basis. That is why the role of our trade unions is so crucial. However, the role of government is also crucial in resolving many of these cases. The Scottish Government would like more powers devolved to this Parliament. However, the record in relation to these types of disputes, disputes that deal with public sector contracts, cannot be characterised as anything other than woeful. Currently, the porters of NHS Tayside are in dispute regarding their pay. The matter has been brought to the attention of this chamber by Jenny Mara when she, was asked, when she asked the Scottish Government to encourage NHS Tayside to bring in the Advisory, Conciliation and Arbitration Service to resolve this dispute. However, this request has so far been denied. Similarly, there has been a long-running dispute at the National Museum of Scotland with regards to the decision by museum management to remove weekend working allowances for their staff. The National Museum of Scotland has topped a poll as the most visited tourist attraction in Scotland, and yet management believe it is OK to remove much-needed money from their workers by simply saying weekend payments are no longer common in the culture and tourism sector across the UK. Is this the type of justice we wish to see for our hard-working public sector staff? The Scottish Government have been posted missing in this dispute, so what would the new powers they so desperately wish for this place do to help this situation? The point is the government simply do not use the powers they currently have to resolve significant workplace problems. So if we base their current plea on their record, I would say it does not look favourable for them. The above examples show how vital it is that we have trade unions. I am a proud trade unionist and I know many in this chamber are. Our pride is shaped by the values of this important body of the labour movement, but is also shaped by the past, something I will talk about in just a moment. But I first want to say that the proposals by the current Conservative government to further restrict the ability of trade unions and individual employees across the UK to access redress to legitimate industrial grievance with a continuation of attacks on fundamental employment rights, including the right to strike, are truly abhorrent and do not belong in a democratic society. Instead of bringing in legislation to limit the rights of trade unionists, we would have liked to see a concentrated effort to support and promote our trade unions and their vital role in industrial relations. As our amendment sets out, we consider higher turnouts in industrial ballots are as desirable as higher turnouts in any other democratic election. But we reject entirely the UK government's suggested approach, which makes no attempt to support overdue reforms. One reform we would support would be the introduction of online balloting, which we believe could attract more people to vote and strike ballots and therefore create the outcomes the UK government tell us they so desperately want. As I said earlier, the history of the trade unions has shaped many of us in this chamber, although maybe not all of us in positive ways. When I mentioned the strike by NHS Tayside porters, I failed to mention that a financial appeal has been launched to make sure that the porters don't lose too much of their income. Many people have contributed to that appeal, including dock workers in Liverpool. This, of course, is not surprising, as that is what we have come to recognise as one of the finest characteristics of our movement. But it goes to show the collective responsibility workers across the UK feel for those finding themselves in these types of disputes. This, of course, is not new. It is something we have seen in many disputes across the years, especially the minor strike of 1984-85. This strike still stains the very fabric of industrial relations in our country. Despite the fact that 95 mi minors have received compensation for the way they were treated, or should I say, mistreated by the police during this time, no officer or indeed government minister has ever been held to account for their actions. That is why Scottish Labour reiterates our call for a public inquiry similar to that of Hillsborough inquiry 
set up. Let's be clear, the Scottish Government have the power to do this, but up until now they have lacked the will. Remember, people have been persecuted for simply taking part in their democratic right to strike. We now hope that these people get the access to justice the Scottish Government so desperately want for others. It was only last week that Neil Findlay held a members debate congratulating the Welsh Government in their efforts to address the matter of blacklisting and employment practices on public funded projects. During that debate, many Labour members reiterated to our call for a full and transparent inquiry into blacklisting, and we again call on the Scottish Government to initiate this inquiry without delay. The issue of blacklisting has not gone away and is still a barrier to employment for many in our communities today. Yes. McKenzie. Do you accept that um, even if an inquiry was held, um, that this government have no powers to actually legislate to prevent these kind of uh, malpractices going on in future? Lord McMahon. No, I don't believe that, and um, I'm glad to see that Mike McKenzie is um, continuing his theme of uh, the last debate last week, because there are many things that the Scottish Government can do in their abdicating responsibility, and I'll go on um, further in my speech to outline that. The Government had previously said that they would wait for the Scottish Affairs Select Committee to report on this matter before deciding their course of action. Well, that committee has reported twice since then, and still we await the Government's response. Previously, the Government said that guidance linked to public procurement was the way to make sure that no company involved in blacklisting would be awarded a Government contract. However, the National Health Service Common Services Agency has awarded a £660 million contract to a consortium of contractors involved in the blacklisting scandal. This contract was awarded after the introduction of the Scottish Government policy note. It is clear that that note is not worth the paper it is written on. This scandal first came to light in 2009, and yet we are still waiting for this Government to grant the access to justice these workers, to these workers and establish an inquiry into these practices. I hope that they will now do so and that they will use their powers over public procurement to make sure that any business involved in this practice does not receive one penny from the public purse. In relation to so-called umbrella companies, we call on the Scottish Government to use their contractual powers to stop the awarding of public contracts to companies using this practice. We know it is happening where public money has been sent, for example at the Ineos site in Grangemouth, and it must be stopped. It cannot be right that workers do not get paid the wage that was agreed, that they do not get holiday pay and that they can be dismissed from their duties without a moment's notice. I would encourage the Government to use all of their existing powers to discourage this practice as soon as possible. We also call on the Scottish Government to use the powers they currently have with regards to the living wage. It is a fact that the Government have voted against their proposals a total of five times now in relation to this extremely important matter. As we know, in 2014, 10% of all those employed in Scotland earned £6.79 an hour or less, and 20% earned less than £7.85 an hour. We have to rectify that and rectify that now. Therefore, we are calling on the Scottish Government to establish a unit within government to actively promote the living wage. I hope that that is something we can work on together. Finally, there are additional powers already coming to Scotland regarding employment tribunals. We believe that this would give us the opportunity to withdraw fees currently levied at people wishing to exercise the democratic right, but we also believe that it is an opportunity to reshape the future of this service. We know that the introduction of fees has led to a decrease of 81 per cent in claim cases. This has had an impact on every section of society, but women have been bearing the brunt of it. As Gillian Merchant from Thomson Solicitors points out, all types of discrimination cases have fallen. However, sex discrimination cases have been most affected with a reduction of 91 per cent. We know that fees can be reduced in some circumstances. However, many women lose out because the criteria for reduction is based on the household income and not individual income. Scotland can and should change this. We have an opportunity to do things differently now, and I hope the Government will take that opportunity. As I said at the outset, we welcome the debate currently taking place regarding where employment legislation should be held. However, we do not believe that the Scottish Government has done nearly enough with the powers they currently have, and we urge them to commit to giving the access to justice the workers I have mentioned today require and deserve. They can and should do that now. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnson to speak to and move Amendment 13442.3. Mr Johnson, you have six minutes, so thereby, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Lest I forget, can I begin by moving the amendment that stands in my name? When I think back to the 1970s, uh, I think of the hairstyles and I think of the fashions, and I think it was the decade that common sense forgot. However, the thing that makes me think that most is the industrial relations that we experienced during that decade. 
Many will remember the strikes. Many will remember the way that great industries were brought to their knees. And few will remember that this happened 10 years before the high days of unemployment, before the days of Margaret Thatcher. In fact, it could well be said that it preceded them because it caused that. Industrial relations made this country an economic failure. And it was with that in mind that great effort has been put in to ensuring that employment rights and access to justice in the workplace are carried out in such a way that does not destroy public service or undermine the means of production in this country. The Conservatives, in fact, have an exceptionally good record. We have been a party that has sought to liberalise the workplace, to make the opportunities available for people to get back into work. And those who do not recognise it do so simply because they see the world through a particular rose colour of spectacles. However, as we address the issues during the course of this debate, it's important that we recognise that the policies that have been in place have resulted in two million new private sector jobs being created over the course of the last UK Parliament and that the employment rate in Scotland has increased by 42,000 in the last year alone. High unemployment rates across the UK and Scotland are largely due to the UK Government's fiscal discipline and robust economic plan which they have stuck to over these five years. But we, of course, support the conclusions of the Smith Commission that employment law should remain reserved to the UK Parliament within a UK framework. Of course, the Smith Commission uh, recommended that the underlying reserve rights and duties of tribunals should continue to be reserved, while the management and operation of reserve tribunals can be devolved. We need to make sure that that is taken forward and made to work for the benefit of all. We, of course, always also agree that while good relations between employers and employees are good for the workforce, uh, it's also extremely good for the economy. And the rights of trade unionists are important, but they are required to be balanced by the rights of hard-working taxpayers who in the past have often had to pick up the bill and carry the can. Indeed, let's go for it. Uh, is the member suggesting, therefore, that hard-working taxpayers, the definition excludes trade unionists? Is that really what the member is saying to the people of Scotland today? No, not at all. You must realise that we on this side of the chamber are entirely inclusive in our approach to this. We are not exclusive and divisive the way that other parties choose to be. But we further agree that businesses should pay a living wage when it is affordable for them to do so. The idea that we should pay a living wage wherever possible is one which does find support in this corner of the chamber. However, if you look at the economy as a whole, you must realise that many small businesses who are very small employers do find it extremely hard to achieve that. And it's important that we should not bully or cajole businesses towards that before they're ready and in a way that will damage their business. And remember, as I've said in this chamber many times before, there is often uh, immigrants to this country, family businesses, who are examples of those who can be most significantly damaged by it. Of course, I welcome the UK Government's legislation to ban exclusivity clauses and zero-hours contracts and to ensure that workers throughout the UK get a fairer deal and greater flexibility in choosing a work pattern suited to their individual needs. Without going into great depth, I would also like to note, uh, everyone to note that we also have concerns about the issue of blacklisting. And while we have not taken a lead in this matter, continue to be interested in finding a solution which satisfies the demands of all. But the important thing that we need to remember is that this country, Scotland, is best served by finding a way of legislating and going forward with employment rights and access to justice, which is UK-wide. The reason for that is that if we choose to go a different way, and we are significantly different, 
then we may actually find ourselves in that situation where workers south of the border are exploited, while workers north of the border are left without jobs. I'm in my last minute. It's important that we are not part of a race to the bottom. And here in this chamber only two days ago, we heard government ministers and SNP backbenchers argue for the case that we should have European-wide standardisation when it comes to workers' rights. It is wholly inconsistent to ask for EU-wide standardisation and not understand the benefits of UK-wide standardisation. <laughs> Peddling the myth of Scottish moral superiority as an excuse for simply driving a wedge into, Scotland, uh, into the UK's single workplace is wholly unacceptable. It's the inevitability of socialist failure, it's the economically illiterate and the morally bankrupt simply re-peddling the myths of the past. Let's grasp the opportunity afforded us by this Conservative government to take forward the rights of workers and the most important right is the right to full employment. Are we the only party in this country that supports that right? Many thanks. And we now move to the open debate. Speakers, and I call on Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Neil Finlay. Six minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I must say the signs for a consensual debate are not particularly uh, favourable since uh, the two selected amendments and indeed the Liberal one that was not simply delete the whole of the government's uh, motion. So let me just redress that apparent um, breakdown of consensus by saying I could think I can probably, on a personal basis, no idea what the government's view is, uh, welcome the, uh, the first four paragraphs of the Labour amendment, which reflect uh, multiple views and, in particular, uh, calls for uh, legalisation of online ballots for trade unions. I think that, unless I'm missing something, sounds a perfectly reasonable thing uh, to be asking for. But I think the thing that's uh, very much at the core of my take on the debate is the Tories' absolutely egregious attitude to democratic mandate. This is a party, of course, that continues to support the anti-democratic, non-democratic, undismissible House of Lords that constitutes the majority of the UK's uh, legislators and which, on a mandate of 37% uh, of the electorate who voted uh, a few weeks ago, uh, want to impose a very, very substantially higher uh, requirement on trade unionists. Now, note, I said trade unionists, not trade unions. Uh, and that was quite deliberate because I think uh, what the Tories are really about is weakening the position of individuals in our society. Uh, in particular, people whose relative lack of power mean they choose to collectively work together to nudge the balance just a little bit in their favour through membership of trade unions. Now, I've long heard the Tories are champions of individualism, but I have to say the current plans absolutely give the lie to that and reinforce my long-term view uh, that the Tories are the party of big business to whom they are absolutely in thrall. There are no more champions of individual citizens whom they wish to remove the human rights cha champion by previous generations of their party, like Winston Churchill, than Napoleon was an intimate uh, friend of Na Wellington 150 years ago. Now, for many of us, a substantial part of our constituency work is about care, and in recent times in particular about carers. As our population ages and more live with multiple concurrent disabilities, conditions and ailments, uh, that's not perhaps surprising. The Tory motion refers to two million private sector jobs that have been created. But of course, they're not necessarily new jobs. A lot of them uh, have simply been a transfer from the private sector. They're not new jobs to the extent of 20 million. And of course, what that means is you move from jobs in a position where they gave uh, priority to public benefit, they're now in the private sector where priority has to be given uh, to the owner's interests for businesses. And that's very rarely improved the conditions of the individuals who've been affected by these moves. And in particular for carers, the commercialisation of carer services has created jobs where the relationship between employed and employer is wholly, wholly out of balance. Now, in Aberdeenshire, we may be comparatively lucky 
I understand that 11 out of the 13 companies providing carer services are living wage employers, but of course there are other difficulties, in particular not paying staff who travel between care appointments is actually very commonplace across Scotland. And in a rural area like Aberdeenshire, actually the council area with the highest proportion of people living... Yes, I will, John Finney. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention. The statutory obligation, of course, rests with the local authority. It's them that's got responsibility for them. It's them that's outsourcing that to the private sector and, by default, condoning that. Stuart Stevenson. I certainly intend to seek to persuade my colleagues in Aberdeenshire Council, now they've taken over the running of it from the Tories, uh, that there may be a different way forward. But, of course, we will be locked into existing contracts, and I know there are difficulties there. But I think... The member's right, there are opportunities there. But in particular in Aberdeenshire, I just make the point, it is the most rural area in mainland Scotland. More of the population live in the rural setting in Aberdeenshire. So for carers who are travelling from appointment to appointment, not being paid a bigger proportion of their day, it's a particular issue. Now, there are many reasons why we need new powers to, over these issues. This is but one of them. I'm sure others will emerge in, in, in the debate. Uh, the majority of us here, I suspect, could make common cause on how we might exercise the new powers, if not unanimously. I suspect the Tories will be elsewhere. Uh, fair work is an awful lot easier to support if we actually have the powers uh, to do it. Now, looking again, as has been mentioned, at access to the legal system to get rights for employees, um, making it more expensive, making it impossibly expensive for those on lower wages is just part of a Tory agenda, absolutely unambiguously clear to remove people who most need the protection of legal system from the opportunity uh, to, 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 to gain that. Um, the debate is about protecting employee rights. We've had various references to trade unions. We've had references to borders. Well, I can't help noticing that the later Labour leadership uh, contenders went to Dublin uh, to speak to trade unionists because we have a trade union that works across borders. Borders are only borders for the, if, uh, and barriers against the effective delivery of policy if we choose to make them. Collaboration is the way forward. I hope we can build some consensus and by pointing to the first half of the Labour motion uh, today, I, I hope that uh, that, that has done so. Um, perhaps at some future date, I'll come forward and say it's time we helped uh, low-level bank employees who've been so damaged by the actions, irresponsible actions, of a tiny number of highly paid, very senior bankers. Presiding officer. Thanks. I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thanks, presiding officer. The, the issue of fairness in the workplace and making life better for working people and their families uh, are the issues that uh, drove my interest in politics and brought me into the Labour movement. And as a teenager, I, I watched in my own community and across the UK as proud men and women lost their jobs as government and corporations discarded loyal workers, often without a thought uh, for the consequences. Industrial closures, uh, British Leyland and Motorola and Bathgate, Pokemet and Levi's and Whitburn Continental Tyres and Newbridge and more recently Halls of Broxburn to name but a few have had a profound and lasting impact on many of the towns uh, in my region and a life-changing impact on the people who lost their livelihood and the reality is that the neoliberal creed worshipped by the sons and daughters of Thatcher sitting of course on the benches over there um, cared not a jot for the plight of people in communities that was not their priority. There was no such thing as, a, as society. Only individuals, Thatcher said, and those with a collective view were singled out. Trade unions, rather than being seen as a force for good, standing up against the exploitation, became, as we know, the enemy within. And every Tory government since has gone on to uh, introduce offensive f uh, legislation, further restrictions on trade unions and their ability to organise. They don't want anyone defending working people. They want to continue the attack on living standards and public services whilst introducing uh, legislation to restrict the ability of working people to stand up for themselves. Uh, Finney. Mr Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for Mr Finlay taking that intervention. Can I perhaps outline the steps taken by the 13 years of Labour government to reverse the Thatcher um, 
worker. Bill Finlay. Erosion. There was huge changes brought in under that time. Uh, we brought in a national minimum wage. We reversed the restrictions at GCHQ. We gave people the right to join a trade union. There was many trade union reforms calm, brought please. under that time. You've got selective memory, Mr. Finney. But if you're asking, but if you're asking, did we go far enough? Of course we didn't go far enough, and I'll always argue that. The difference is between me and some of the people over here is they never disagree with their own party on anything because they're just a shower of sheep who follow whatever they're told. Um, President officer, uh, it's for those reasons that since entering this parliament I have championed uh, issues and campaigned against injustices that impact on the lives of working people. And I'm pleased that we are debating the devolution of employment rights. But it doesn't do justice to the importance of this debate to just say we want powers for power's sake or uh, allow employment rights to become just another pawn in the game of constitutional wrangling. The government has to set out why powers should be devolved, not at the moment, how powers, uh, why powers should be devolved and what they will do with them. Now, I am personally and have been for some time convinced of the case for devolving employment law. I set out those reasons publicly during the Labour, Le Labour leadership election, but only after a great deal of thought and consideration, not at the moment. And uh, because as we see currently in our colleges and our legal system and social care and the rest, devolving power does not necessarily mean better decision making. No, thank you. And there are different opinions on this in my party and across the Labour movement. And it's incumbent upon us to debate these issues through. So, providing of, presiding officer, what, we can, do, what uh, can we do using the powers we have now and any powers that may be devolved? Because there's no point in having the power if you're not going to do anything with it. And in life, we can find excuses for things we don't want to do. Teaching in school, I heard every excuse under the sun for pupils not doing their homework, usually the dog or the school bus featuring prominently among them. And I've exhausted my back catalogue of excuses for not going on a diet, taking more exercise, or giving up the odd eh, beer or two. But, and we can all trot out excuses and repeat them. But on each occasion, the credibility of that excuse becomes less and less convincing. And so it is with the Scottish Government on many of the employment issues they appear to champion. So let me be positive and suggest some steps the Scottish Government could take to show its intent. They could settle that 18 month long dispute with PCS members at the National Museum. They could sort out with the Unite Porters at Nine Mills Hospital that dispute. The Education Secretary could end the attack on our colleges and stop blaming teachers and actually support them. The teaching unions would appreciate that. They could support a bill to protect shop workers along, eh, from violence along with USDAW. They could use the weight of government to hold companies to account over blacklisting and help the construction industry self-cleanse. GMB and UCAT would support this. They could set up the living wage unit as mentioned, not just to get companies to be accredited, but to get more and more companies to pay it. The STUC would support that. They could use the Fair Work Convention to bring in companies like Amazon, who remember have received £10 million of selective assistance, and tackle them about their pure, pure, uh, poor employment practice and their anti-union stance. They could do something about 30 years of injustice against Scottish miners. The NUM would support that. They could introduce free bus travel for apprentices, some of the lowest paid workers in the country. And they could explain how they intend increasing public sector and influencing private sector pay. And they could help finance the Scottish Hazard Centre and introduce corporate homicide legislation. At the general election, I was involved in setting out Labour's workplace manifesto with a positive vision for justice and fairness in the workplace. And I hope that many of the policies we put forward will be supported by the Scottish Government. It's time, President Officer, for less talk and more action with the powers that we have now before we get any more. Thanks very much. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Graham Pearson. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Less work and more action. Yeah, that's rich coming for Neil Finlay. With my long background history of involvement and support for the trade union movement, I'm very, very aware of the primary importance of decent 
working practices. We are talking, of course, about payment of a living wage, about holiday pay, about the length of the working week, about women's equal rights at work, as well as exploitative abuse of zero-hour contracts, harassment at work and blacklisting. Presiding officer, Citizens Advice Scotland says that employment problems are one of the most common types of issues clients face. And I experienced that a few weeks ago when I spent an afternoon at the Hamilton Citizens Advice Bureau and I commend them for the amazing work they do. But, presiding officer, the fees now charged to bring a claim to an employment tribunal mean many with a case are unable to fight it. These charges range from £390 to £1,200 just to fill the form in and hear the case. These fees need to be removed so as to allow access to justice. The trade unions have been good at helping people find the money to bring such a case, but they should not need to carry the burden any more than the victims themselves. And, presiding officer, we heard from the Cabinet Secretary earlier some of the figures. But in the period of October to December 2012, there were 774 unfair dismissal cases. In the same three months period in 2014, there were 272. In October to December 2012, there were 186 sex discrimination cases. In the same period in 2014, there were just 27, a reduction of 85%. That is not justice in anybody's eyes. There are some tribunal cases eligible for free remission, but the criteria and the flux in a client's financial situation makes determining eligibility highly complex. Even when an award is made by a tribunal, that is often not paid. The system in Scotland should be strengthened to address this, this issue, but because of the overlap with reserve matters, we currently lack the powers to enforce payment. And some action I would like to see out in Neil Finlay and his party is to hear at least a single Scottish Labour member in this place or their single Scottish member in Westminster call for the devolution of employment law. That's the type of action I want to see. <laughs> Presiding officer, this government legislated last year to make Scotland's devolved tribunals simpler and more flexible, but we are unable to go far enough to tackle the underlying issues. Only fully devolved powers over employment law will allow us to sort out this mess. We want to make work Point fair. Point of order, Neil Finlay. On a point of order, a point of information for the, the, the member, if she did not, um, if she would reflect on my speech that I just made, I did say that I was convinced of that call for the devolution of employment rights. Just to put the record straight, President Officer. As you know, Mr Finlay, that is not a point of order. You have nonetheless made your point. Christina McKelvey, please continue. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We want to make work fair and we want it to pay fair wages. Contrary to the Conservative view, we don't believe employers need to exploit people in order to make a profit. On the contrary, better paid and decent employment leads to a stronger economy for us all. We want to ensure that at least 500 organisations are set out by the Cabinet Secretary to join the Living Wage Accreditation Scheme. I am one of those employers. We want zero-hour contracts that are easy to misuse, and many of my constituents have suffered from the devastating impact of not knowing whether any work is going to be available at the start of the week, never mind the end of the week. The UK Government needs to strengthen the law to give protection for unfair dismissal and to have full parental leave and pay rights for zero-hour workers and to give them the statutory right to request a contract to guarantee their hours. While these legal reinforcements are essential, they are only part of the story. There is also a critical human justice dimension. It is, is it acceptable, presiding officer, that someone can be dismissed because they have been off sick or tried to take a holiday? Is it appropriate that they are told with a text message that they no longer have a job? No, I don't think so. The numerous examples of malpractice in the Citizens Advice Scotland report include people not being paid at all, employers who fail to pay employee income tax and national insurance contribution, leaving the employee to pick up the bill. They have seen many, many examples of people being paid below the national minimum wage, never mind the living wage, and people denied sick pay when seriously ill. Employees have been told that they can't take paid holiday leave, women dismissed because they were pregnant, and a highly alarming rate of racist and sexist bullying at work. And migrant workers, presiding officer, are especially exploited and made to work excessive hours. Though the Smith Commission recommended, and I quote, all powers over the management and operation of all reserve tribunals will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament, unquote. 
The current Scotland Bill falls well short of that. It would allow Westminster to make changes without any requirement to consult the Scottish Government, not the respect to gender we were promised. The whole employment system is heavily biased in favour of the employer, leaving workers struggling to get even the most basic rights. Not only are employment tribunals expensive, even when they make an award, enforcing the payments adds more costs and may not be successful in any event. Only 41% of successful claimants actually manage to get an award. This is absolutely unacceptable. Westminster is determined to move backwards. The Scottish Government has categorically rejected the Tories' move to restrict the right to strike, rapidly becoming the only option left to badly treated employees. The trade unions presiding officer are our key partners, and the STUC has, changed, has signed a memorandum of understanding with the First Minister, which commits to fight austerity. Twelve billions in welfare cuts and further erosion of trade union you employment rights. Close, Presiding officer, I call on all of my colleagues across this chamber to pressure the UK government to devolve employment law to this place and to allow us to get on with building the fairer society that we all strive for. Hey, thanks. And I now call on Graham Pearson to be followed by Gordon Macdonald. Thank you, Presiding officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate this afternoon. In work the application of employment law, the protection and promotion of rights and responsibilities for workers is of paramount import. In that context, the right to strike is not only a necessary but a fundamental right in a society that encourages people to sell their labour for a salary or wage. If Alec Johnson needs evidence of the need for a wide-ranging debate outlined in Labour's amendment, he needs only to examine the impact of zero-hour contracts on constituents who no doubt live in his area, uh, a contract which enables some employers to demand people to turn up at their own cost at uh, the described times, but then to be sent away home as work is not available to them, and the cost of, of those attendances is borne by the employee. He should look at part-time working, which for some employees is not by agreement, but by a, an arrangement from an employer to take it or leave it. And that in, uh, enables employers to pick and choose as they would wish and to discard workers when it doesn't suit them. He should also have a look at the impact of the so-called minimum wage, which in its time was entirely virtuous in trying to drive up the costs of labour but minimum wage and even the living wage is not the level of earnings which allows families not only to exist to, to, but to play a part in our economy and play a part in society. And then, of course, we have the blacklisting which has been spoken about by others here in the chamber and also pre-packed administration which has affected so many companies eh, in Scotland in the last year. Uh, I have direct uh, experience of pre-packed administration. I was called to Kilmarnock and uh, invited to hold a meeting with workers who had suffered the outcomes from such an administration. Uh, and 200 workers in a fashion directorate were told with 15 minutes notice that they were now no longer employed. They discovered that although some of them were in full-time employment with contracts, some of them in part-time employment, and some of them employed on zero-hour contracts through agencies, that none of them were given rights by their employer and that they were leaving the premises with no redundancy payments with a view that it would be left to lawyers to pursue some payments on their behalf from government agencies. If that is modern uh, employment relationships, it's the kinds of relationships that I would want nothing to do with, and it's the kinds of relationships that I think that this Parliament and the Parliament across the United Kingdom should ensure no longer occurs. In the light of that experience, the call from the government for a full and swift devolution of powers over employment law seems to reject the complexity of what we are trying to deal with here. From a union perspective, the presence of two different approaches in these islands would not only, 
I am happy to take the intervention. Sandra White. I, I thank the member for taking an intervention. You mentioned the fact about complexity and two different areas, exactly what uh, the Tory party said. But do you not agree that they, do you not agree what the SGC called for the full powers to be brought here? So you're against what the SGC said? Graham Pearson. I am grateful for that intervention. I have got to say that in my working life of 38 years in the public sector, my conditions and the service that applied to me were maintained thanks to collective bargaining across the whole of the United Kingdom to ensure that public sector workers here were paid the value of their labour, no matter whether it was in Aberdeen or in London. So from a union viewpoint, I am sorry, I won't have time. Uh, from a union viewpoint, I think that the two different approaches in this island smashes the approach of the power of a unified worker and enables employers to divide and overcome. From an employer's view for, viewpoint, I think it places businesses in the situation of choosing a location which provides them the most conducive circumstances with which to employ people and take advantage of any shortcomings on either side of the change in that divide. And from an employee's viewpoint, it sets the nation's workers against each other. It allows workers on one side of a divide to try and take advantage of those who are less able to defend their, their situation and creates the opportunity for employers to move their businesses about these islands in a way that is good for profit, but is certainly not good for the prospects of living wages for the future. In all the circumstances, I would have thought, as was acknowledged by a member in the opposite benches, that now is indeed a good opportunity for a truly wide-ranging debate to look at all the circumstances that we are considering just now. It should not be the position of any member in this parliament to take pride in the fact that we maintain merely a living wage. We need to drive up the value of our workers in Scotland not only for their integrity and for their own self-respect, but ensure that Scotland is a place to live where we all can hold our heads high and we can all pay our way and contribute. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over the last 30 years, trade union membership has halved partly as a result of legislation passed by the Conservative Government in the 1980s that gradually reduced the autonomy of trade unions and the legality of industrial action. The Labour Government of Blair and Brown made no attempt to overturn much of this legislation. As a result, after the last five years of a Westminster Tory Lib Dem coalition government, we have an employment situation where many have insecurity of employment, are underemployed, and are low-waged. Zero-hour contracts are on the rise, with the Office for National St Statistics highlighting that in the UK, employees with no guaranteed hours have risen 26% since 2013, from 1.4 million to 1.8 million in 2014. A large proportion of people have as their main job a zero-hour contract, and there are thousands who have held zero-hour contract posts for 10 years with no access to employee benefits other than those guaranteed by law, such as holiday pay. Not only that, but as the Resolution Foundation discovered, some employers use zero-hour contracts as a management tool that disempowers the employee. Employees who are unable to work additional hours because of childcare issues or refuse to do additional hours at the end of a week's work find that they are zeroed down which is effectively where they are pushed to a very few or no hours in the medium or long term. Then there are the underemployed. The TUC analysis pu published in September last year identified that underemployment at the current level of 3.4 million is over a million higher than it was before the recession. Eurostat data shows that the rate of underemployment in the UK in 2014 was worse in the rest of the EU 28 countries other than the five countries with high unemployment. The result of this underemployment is that for many people their incomes are lower than they would like 
because their employer is unable or unwilling to offer them a longer working week. So their living standards are lower than they would want, and many of these workers will be claiming in-work benefits due to their low earnings. In terms of earnings, the Eurostat analysis across Europe highlights that annual net earnings in Germany grew by 16 per cent between 2007 and 2014, with France seeing an increase of 13 per cent over the same period. In comparison, the UK annual net earnings fell by 2.5 per cent. And low-paid workers will not be able to fall back on support from welfare payments as the newly elected Tory government highlighted in the Queen's speech that new legislation will freeze the main rates of the majority of working age benefits, tax credits and child benefit for two years from 2016 to 2017. The GMB union warned last month that 3.2 million in-work families who currently receive child tax credits and working tax credits face a cut in their weekly income. The minimum wage since 2009 has failed to keep pace with inflation and the 1.1 million workers in receipt of it have seen their standard of living fall. The Resolution Foundation have estimated that even if the minimum wage increases to £7.12 by 2017, it will still be worth less in real terms than what it was worth in 2004. The Foundation identified that if the minimum wage was increased to the living wage, the government would save money. If the 1.1 million workers on the minimum wage and the 3.6 million workers who are paid below the living wage received that level of increase, then they estimate that a saving of $2.2 billion a year could be made as a result of higher tax and higher national insurance receipts and lower spending on tax credits and benefits. For many workers, their standard of living is falling and they feel that they have no influence to change the situations. Unions no longer have the same power through collective bargaining and legislation has reduced their ability to react to situations quickly. The pendulum has swung too far in the employer's favour and as lawyer Edward Cooper stated at the time of changes to employment tribunal fees, an underlying assumption in these proposals is that employers all act reasonably. We see day in and day out that employers do not always act reasonably, especially when there is money to be saved. However, the new Conservative government, rather than addressing the issue of low pay and conditions with employers and discussing a way forward with trade unions, have they decided to further undermine the remaining influence that trade unions hold. The proposed trade unions bill will introduce a 50% voting threshold for union ballot turnouts, and for public services, 40% of those entitled to vote must vote in favour of industrial action. Yet the Tories were elected last month on only 37% of the vote, or 24% of the eligible vote. One rule for one and another rule for the other, I take it. There has to be a recognition that trade unions are the collective voice that allows employees to challenge management decisions, bringing a measure of balance to the employment relationship. Unions are best placed to represent workers, to ensure they are not exploited and can defend the weak, vulnerable and disadvantaged. Rather than undermining further the role of trade unions, the Westminster Government should ensure there is balance between the rights of employers and worker representatives. If they are not prepared to do this, then they should devolve the responsibility for employment law to this place in order that we can address the issues. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, employment rights are fundamental to a well-functioning economy. The aim should be a fair, simple and transparent system where workers know their rights and protections under the law and where businesses are equally clear of those rights and their responsibilities. Too many employees and employers are simply unaware of their rights and their responsibilities and that must be uh, addressed. But constitu constitutional change, I don't think, will improve matters. In the UK wide market, there's no sense in having one set of rules and regulations for companies south of the border and another for those operating in Scotland. Not only would differences create unnecessary complications for companies that operate in both countries, 
but also for the numerous individuals who work across the UK. Our economy is increasingly global. Just this week we had a debate on the importance of, of the EU. I therefore fail to see the sense in putting up needless boundaries, of course. Mike McKenzie. Uh, I was uh, very interested in uh, Jim Hume talking about the global economy and, of course, international companies seem to manage perfectly well to work across numerous countries. Why should it be a problem for countries working across different conditions in the UK and, uh, and the rest of the UK and Scotland? Yes. Thank you. Well, well, I think you'll find it's more common for people to work across the UK than they do work uh, globally. Uh, as, as I said, parties had the op op uh, and if the member would like to listen, parties had the opportunity to discuss these matters during the Smith Commission process and the agreement by all parties was that employment law should remain reserved to the UK Parliament within a UK-wide framework, framework. And we believe that the agreement is the most sensible and still sustainable position. Of course, as our economy and workforce grows, it's important not only to embrace the opportunities which that bring, brings, but also to acknowledge some of the challenges. Low pay is certainly one of those challenges. That's why we, as part of the previous UK administration, Liberal, Liberal Democrats followed the recommendations of the Low Pay Commission and increased the national minimum wage, and that is why we support the living wage being paid. It's also why we acted to end exclusivity clauses and zero-hours contracts. Zero-hours contracts can suit some workers, for example students, but they should not be widely used or used to the detriment of individual workers. And of course, in government, we forced the Conservative Party to U-turn when they then wanted to undermine workers' rights by introducing moves to give companies sweeping powers to dismiss underperforming employees. And we started a wide-ranging employment review because, as, a, as the former business secretary said that, and I quote, now the economy is firmly on the road to recovery, it's important that the fruits of the recovery are shared by all. Confident, secure employees spend money which is ultimately good uh, for UK PLC. We also work to bring in uh, more rights for employees, updating employment rights to fit with the realities of modern life, things like shared parental leave and a right to ask to work flexibly. Neither the benefits of recent reforms nor the challenges facing working people and employers are exclusive to Scotland. They span the UK and we believe that they are best addressed at a UK-wide level. With that in mind, we welcome the Fair Work Convention, which was announced in April. Its task is to learn from national and international research and cutting-edge practice in employment relations. I'm sure that its input will be valuable, and I look forward to hearing more about its work. Part of the Convention's remit is uh, looking at gender equality in Scotland. That is a, a crucially important part of its remit. I very much welcome the work that the Coalition did to highlight and close the gender pay gap, but more must be done, not just on pay, but on equality of opportunity in our workplaces. And I'm glad to see that the First Minister herself has taken this very point up today with the IMF in her uh, trip to the United States. Just this week, we saw a Nobel laureate, Sir Tim Hunt, make inexcusable uh, comments about women working in the scientific community. I think his views are a reminder that equality is still an aspiration and not something which can uh, be taken for granted by us. We know that we must get more women into the workforce and particularly in STEM areas to meet our economy's future demands. So I hope that the Convention will look particularly at the STEM area and what more can be done to support women into the field as well as other underrepresented groups, of course. Such work is crucial, absolutely crucial, if we are to reach our potential not only as individuals but also as a society and a country. Clarity around employment rights not only protects workers, but also ensures that businesses are clear on their responsibilities and the rights which their staff have. So while it's right that we work to further improve the situation, we should do so with our neighbours in the United Kingdom. As I've said, our challenges are not unique, and the interests both of employees and employers are best served by a collective approach, an approach which reflects the diverse nature of businesses operating in the UK. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. <coughs> and I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Richard Baker. Uh, thank you, Deputy thereby. Presiding Officer. I'm going to address the Labour Amendment and pretty well ignore the Tory Amendment, though I found Alec Johnson's speech bizarrely entertaining, so I must be needing a rest. 
But of course, I agree with the sentiments in the Labour amendment opposing regressive punitive restrictions on the rights of the workforce through trade unions to withdraw their labour. It's a basic human right. I support online balloting, balloting the living wage, creating a unit to promote the living wage and so on. In fact, the Scottish Government established the Fair Work... <laughs> 37 seconds, yes. Sophie Jim, Jim. It's, it's now 40, 40 seconds. Uh, if the member supports the living uh, wage, uh, Scottish living wage, I just wonder why the member hasn't been accredited as a Scottish living wage uh, employer as many MSPs have. I have always paid the living wage, but I'm very thrown. And when a newspaper tries to bully me into doing something I do willingly, I won't comply. So be, be aware that I do pay a living wage, always have done, always will. There you are. I'm accrediting, my, I'm accrediting myself. You never took an intervention from me, naughty person, so sit down. Um, the action. The government established the Fair Work Convention to give um, independent Christine advice Graham, to the government. Can you just stop for a minute, Ms Graham? I will decide who's naughty and who's not. I not beg your for pardon. You. I beg Continue. your pardon, presiding officer. I was carried away with the moment. Um, the action in funding the Poverty Alliance to promote the living wage accreditation and have had an additional 200,000. Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014. Ministers can issue statutory guidance on a range of issues, including the principle that blacklisters are excluded from public works unless they have taken appropriate remedial measures. Improving FAIs for uh, accidents in the workplace, of course, and it's currently under scrutiny by the Justice Committee, and not the least to ensure that relatives of the deceased are more informed and we try to tackle delays within the system. But the issue for me, why has the Labour Party deleted all of the SNP motion from calls for? This means that the words calls for full and swift devolution of powers over employment law to ensure the protection and promotion of the rights and responsibilities of workers in Scotland opposes the UK government's plans to further restrict the right to strike. If you compare that with the words in Labour's amendment, which are wishy-washy, it doesn't take calls for it. It says welcomes the wide-ranging debate that is taking place notes that the UK government has indicated its intention to further restrict the ability of trade unions and individual employees to strike. It doesn't have any weight in it whatsoever. It's limp-wristed, there's no punch to it, and it's pretty well where the Labour Party is today. It's essential that employment law is fully devolved. How otherwise does this Parliament redress the inequalities our inability to tackle health and safety addressed in an issue within uh, Neil Finlay's speech. It has a substantial impact on FAIs. How do we tackle zero-hours contracts without employment law? How do we tackle inequalities now in tribunals without employment law? Now, while Labour apparently has gone soft with the Tories on their amendment, the SNP and the S2UC are hand in glove on this because it makes common sense. If you want to tackle these injustices, you have to have the powers. But Labour, of course, is in this bind. It simply cannot go further because it's thorough to UKHQ Labour in the south of England. And they're playing to a different constituency. Alec Rowley has it right. Joanne Lamont had it right. The only salvation of Labour in Scotland is to detach itself from Labour UK. Because the socialist force it once was, it could become again and could lead the way and show the rest of the UK what ought to be happening in employees' rights. It won't, of course. Labour will stay in bed with the Tories. It'd rather have the Tories down south obliterating employment rights in Scotland than have these rights come here. It is continuing to add another page to one of the longest suicide notes for a political party in history. And I'll say this to Neil Finlay. I am no sheep. Are you? Let's see if you'll vote against the Labour amendment. Through the chair, which please. Delete, let's see if the member will delete the commitment against the Labour amendment, which deletes the commitment to devolve employment law. The official report at decision time will speak much more than your rhetoric in here. We'll see who'll be sheepish then. Thank you. Now call Richard Baker to be followed by Mike McKenzie.
Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. On this side of the Chamber, we always welcome the chance to debate rights at work and access to justice. Uh, that's not only evident in the campaigns we take to this Parliament uh, and this Chamber, along with our colleagues in the trade union and labour movement, but also in the proposals we have brought to this Chamber to change the laws of Scotland to the benefit of working people, and that these proposed changes in law are in our amendment today. I wouldn't expect any member to vote against the amendment which talks about changing laws on culpable homicide, on blacklisting, uh, on fatal accident inquiries, much of the change of laws to improve the rights uh, of people, working people in Scotland. And it's these areas we wish to challenge ministers and, and in, in my view, rightly challenge ministers to do more. And of course, it's right to consider where the power to legislate uh, on these matters in the broader context best lies. It's right to do that now as the Scotland Bill is debated. Our minds are also focused on these issues due to the further threats to erode workers' rights from the Tory government. Unfortunately, presiding officer, some things uh, never change, as we've heard in the debate today. The UK government's plans to restrict the right to strike will only damage employee relations and working environments in our country. Not only that, but their previous actions in slashing budgets for health and safety and restricting access to tribunals have already been detrimental to workers' rights. Although on access to justice, the Scottish Government's own record is lacking as well. Ministers here can do much more to improve access to justice for workers in Scotland. The key issue for me in this debate is that while we consider what powers may be devolved further in terms of employment law, that must not be an excuse, as Mr Finlay has said, for Scottish ministers not to use the powers they have now to improve workers' rights. Uh, earlier, uh, Neil Finlay spoke passionately and eloquently of the need for a full public inquiry into blacklisting and for ministers to stand by their pledge to ensure companies who are involved in blacklisting or have not made full reparation for their involvement should not win public sector contracts. It's time for ministers to stand by the pledges they've made on this issue. My colleague Patricia Ferguson has brought forward proposals for reform of the fatal accident inquiry system, which are desperately needed. And I would ask ministers to work with her to improve the law in Scotland, as she has proposed. This is an issue of great importance in my own region, the North East, as the families of the 16 people who lost their lives in the 2009 Super Puma helicopter crash had to wait five years for that fatal accident inquiry to take place. Five years of them answering questions, five years of lessons not being learned about how to make these aircraft safer for the future. That is simply not acceptable, and its vital reforms are made so that, so that the families of the Sumbra Super Puma crash in 2013 don't have to wait five years themselves for the answers which they are seeking as well. Presiding officer, I have also proposed changes in law with regard to culpable homicide, which would mean this area of Scots law is fit for purpose in today's Scotland. It will ensure that where someone loses their life because of the recklessness or negligence of their employer, that employer could be held properly accountable in the courts and not merely receive a fine, but face a custodial sentence as would apply in other cases of culpable homicide. This proposal was first brought by Karen Gillan after the death of the Findlay family in a gas explosion for which the company Transco faced charges of culpable homicide, but the court found that Scots law in its current form did not allow the company to be convicted of the charge. Since then, there have been further fatalities where it's been found employers have breached health and safety, from the lives lost on the flying phantom tug to the helicopter crashes in the North Sea to which I referred earlier. And in cases like these, there should be the opportunity for the Crown to pursue charges of culpable homicide where that's appropriate. This reform of the law is not only necessary to ensure Scots criminal law can deliver justice in these cases, but also to bring a greater impetus on employers to have regard to the welfare of their workers. As the United Scottish Secretary Pat Rafferty has said, in 2012-13, 22 people died at work in Scotland and the five-year average is around 20 fatalities a year. That's completely unacceptable when we have the power to do something about it. Presiding officer, I'm grateful to the Justice Secretary for meeting myself and Unite and other promoters of this legislation to discuss the issues involved, and I hope we can continue to work with Scottish ministers to deliver this much-needed reform of our law. 
I'm also taking forward a bill proposal to protect workers' rights to damages, which were again eroded by the previous UK government, changes which I believe leave us in breach of European law and that Scottish ministers therefore have a duty to rectify. So, uh, President Officer, the challenge to this Parliament is to contribute to the debate uh, in and beyond this chamber and in the context of the Scotland Bill about how we improve legislation around employment. But the challenge remains to ministers to listen to the calls from trade unions and campaigners today to take the action they can take now to improve the rights of workers in Scotland and their access to justice. Many thanks. Before I call Mike McKenzie, can I advise the Chamber that we have a little bit of time in hand if uh, members wish to intervene, they can, and if members wish to take interventions, they can be recompensed for that. Mike McKenzie, to be followed by Alison Johnston. Thank you, President Officer. The thing I find depressing about this debate, which is essentially about the balance between workers' rights versus those of the bosses and the business owners, is that we've been here before many years ago and many times. I remember the same debates when I first began to become politically aware as a young teenager. At times, and I'll concede that these were under Labour governments, we seemed to make some progress. Then under the Tories we regressed. Then again we made some progress and then we re regressed. For the last 30 years we've been regressing under both Labour and Tory governments. This is a dismal position to be in in the 21st century, fighting these same old battles over and over again. I feel as if I'm a member of Generation Groundhog. And in the meantime, other countries, our economic competitors, have made real progress with a more modern approach to labour relations. So it will be no surprise to members, presiding officer, that I fully support the government's motion and the STUC's proposals that we should have full devolution of powers over the minimum wage, trade union and employment law, health and safety law, and much more besides. Likewise, I'm keen to see the completion of the work of, of, of the fair work. Uh, conventions work. There are many, many good lessons from elsewhere for it to draw on. It was the great economist John Kenneth Galbraith who first described the theory of countervailing power, and it was this wisdom that he brought to bear when he was instrumental and influential in the rebuilding of the German economy after the war, getting the correct practical and pragmatic balance between businesses workers, consumers, citizens, and the role that government ought to play in this. And it's this that's enabled the German economy to become the powerhouse of Europe. And getting this balance right has enabled an economy with significantly higher productivity than we have. Getting this balance right has enabled a far more equal and egalitarian society, where today a bricklayer might live next door to a surgeon. And he or she may not earn quite as much as a surgeon, but he is, or she is a respected member of the community, going to work smartly dressed, changing into overalls at work. But here in the UK, we are still afflicted by, by a hierarchical class structure, where bosses are perceived to belong in a higher echelon than workers, where white collar is better than blue collar, where women are still considered second class members of the workforce. And apart from all the other malign effects of this class structure, it is not economically efficient. The First Minister is currently in the United States. Perhaps surprisingly, there are some lessons from there too. I first became aware of this reading US construction press and comparing it to our own. Ours is exclusively filled with the views of company directors and finance officers. The US press has some of this, but it also contains the news and the views of individual workers and owners of small and sometimes very small businesses. It is a society that in some ways, but by no means all, 
is more egalitarian than ours, and it is not so in love with the collar and tie that it always puts those who wear them at the top of the hierarchy of importance. But there are lessons too, presiding officer, from our own Scottish history. We used to have a ladder of opportunity that saw some people work their way all, up, all the way up from the shop floor to the boardroom. The boardroom decisions were greatly enhanced by the wisdom and the experience of these folk. This was a celebrated part of our culture. But now, economic and social mobility is declining rather than improving. And that's been the case for many years. So, presiding officer, what I find sad about the opposition amendments is their poverty of ambition, their lack of aspiration for Scotland, their lack of ambition for Scotland. They seem to be content. They seem to be complacent. They seem to be unconcerned about our lack of progress. They're so in love with this so obviously failing union that this trumps all other concerns. They were elected to serve their constituents, the people of Scotland. But nobody can ride two horses at once. Nobody can unite those two loyalties. No one can serve two masters. And when they awaken to these basic facts, the people of Scotland may well find that they can once again support these parties. But I suspect, presiding officer, that that day may not come very soon. Thank you. And I call Alison Johnston to be followed by Sandra White. Um, thank you, presiding officer. This is a truly important debate because employee rights are vital to protecting people in the workplace. They can protect us when things go wrong, when companies get into difficulties, or in the face of unscrupulous employers. And they've been hard won by labour and trade union campaigners over the decades. Workers' rights are human rights. Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, everyone has the right to work, to free choice of employment, to just and favourable conditions of work, and to protection against unemployment. It goes on to cover equal pay for equal work, the right to just remuneration and social protection worthy of human dignity and the right to join trade unions. And these rights are also embedded in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and in part in the UK Human Rights Act. Strong employee rights are vital, but they are facing a barrage of attack from the UK government. We've heard from other MSPs this afternoon about the Conservative plan for a 40% threshold for strike ballots in health, transport, fire services or schools. And as the Minister and other colleagues have noted, this UK Tory government, with 37% of the vote, didn't quite make the grade, but it is still proposing abolition of the Human Rights Act. Employee rights are also under attack from the government's support at UK level of TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the so-called free trade agreement that is really a corporate power grab endangering workers' rights. And TTIP proposals will give corporations influence over laws and regulatory convergence risks lowering health and safety protections. It is an affront to democracy and TTIP should be scrapped. Presiding officer, governments have to be free to make changes that will improve the lives of their citizens and raising the minimum wage to the living wage is exactly the sort of policy Greens will continue to fight for. And we argued in the general election that by 2020 the minimum wage should be £10 to ensure that nobody in work is faced with poverty. We support, too, the introduction of wage ratios. And the rise of zero-hours contracts, much discussed this afternoon, is another example where workers' rights are being eroded. They will work for a few people, but for most, these contracts exploit people who desperately need work. And I support calls from the STUC for full employment protections for all workers, regardless of employment status. The Scottish Green Party supported the devolution of employment law during the Smith process and was disappointed that that progress wasn't made. And this support wasn't just motivated by the desire to see them protected, it also makes sense. The STUC said in their Smith Commission submission, 
it's easier to imagine coherent policies on economic development, tackling inequality through public service provision, welfare and active labour market intervention, if the Scottish Parliament is empowered to tackle discrimination, poor employment practice, insecure employment, low minimum wages and to create healthier workplaces and promote collective bargaining. And employment protections are fully devolved to Northern Ireland, so it can be done while maintaining a single labour market. Employment services and fair access to employment tribunals are referred to in the government motion, and devolution here is warmly welcome. Since the introduction of tribunal fees, there's been an 81% drop in applications to the employment tribunal. And this is a serious access to justice issue for workers. Citizens Advice Scotland, in their briefing for today, set out their advisers' experience and they found that fees negatively alter the power balance between workers and employers and that the decision whether to take a claim to the tribunal is no longer based on merit but on personal finances. Can the person afford justice or not? And with the fees we've discussed this afternoon, that is no surprise. And very often those who most need to challenge employment practices are being priced out of doing so. I would support the Law Society's view that we heard in committee that any limitations to tribunal devolution be restricted to those which are objectively necessary. And Spice produced a comparison of the Smith Agreement versus the Scotland Bill and they've marked the devolution proposals on employment programmes in red because they didn't address any of the devolution committee's concern. And this has to change, and I hope it will change. Um, I too support those calling for a weekend allowance for all staff in the National Museum of Scotland. And I too look forward to the establishment of a much needed Scottish Hazard Centre that will actively campaign for safer and healthier workplaces and more effective enforcement by the health and safety executive and by local authorities. I think Graham Pearson, in his um, contribution this afternoon, spoke of his concern about different practices by trade unions in different parts of these islands. Um, and he questioned the need for two different approaches. But if the one approach that we have is regressive and truly woeful, then I would support those two different approaches. And Alex Johnston, in, in his contribution, spoke of socialist failure. And last night I was watching the, the late news, and I can't remember, it was one of the, the major channels, and I, I saw a, a dinner of bankers who were described as the elite. And is it not the case that if the losses that they had incurred hadn't been socialised, then failure may have been truly catastrophic? Presiding officer, in closing, I would suggest that this parliament does all it does to enhance, protect and promote employers, employees' rights. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I now call Sandra White to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Officer. And Thank you very much, President Officer. Can I just thank Mike McKenzie for his excellent contribution and Alison Johnson also, who raised the issue of uh, employment law being devolved to Northern Ireland, which is something I think people should actually you know, remember uh, when we're talking in this particular debate about employment law. I wanted to start off with... Uh, what the Scottish Government is doing at the moment. Uh, obviously, there's lots and lots, but haven't time enough to, to say uh, everything. But some of the areas that I've picked up on, in particular, I think is most helpful, is the partnership working that the Scottish Government has entered into, uh, not with, just with trade unions, with businesses, and also the third sector, uh, promoting the fair work, the living wage, and uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, the establishment of the Fair Work con Convention uh, that was mentioned by Mike McKenzie. Uh, and when you look into the Fair Work Convention, it's absolutely wonderful, I think. It's something that should be welcomed by everyone, basically providing independent advice to the Scottish Government on industrial relations to help reduce the inequality of some of the matters there and promote equality and diversity amongst the workplace framework for Scotland. I just wanted to mention that positive note in my contribution at the very beginning, because I obviously, in my contribution, I want to mention some of the issues that's been raised by... Uh, the Conservatives and the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats 
as well. Uh, as I say, I welcome this debate. To, uh, I think in the present climate uh, of austerity, zero contracts and a tax on workers' rights uh, basically being put forward by this Westminster government, I think it's really important that we do have this debate, not just that we can debate it, but that workers in Scotland and the rest of the UK can see that this Scottish Parliament takes this very, very seriously. Now, as a former shop steward, uh, I, like many others, are deeply concerned regarding this retrograde step to workers' rights, rights which many people fought for, many people who obviously were in trade unions, many people who were belonging to a number of political parties. Uh, at the time I was a shop steward, I was a member of the SNP, I've never been a member of any other party, but I took my responsibilities, uh, you know, very much to, to my heart and, and represented my workers no matter what political party. So it actually it pains me deeply to see exactly what's happening in the Westminster government and what's going to be visited upon people throughout the UK, Scotland and other areas as well by the retrograde step that they are putting forward. Now, I did try to say, what can I say about the Labour and Tory amendments? And their contributions, and Annabel Goldie, sorry, Annabel Ewing, sorry, Annabel, uh, got in before me uh, in regards to one of the, the Tory amendments about the rights of hard working taxpayers. I was going to intervene as well. And, you know, Annabel was absolutely right uh, to say that uh, does uh, the Tory party not think that uh, trade unionists are hard working taxpayers also? Uh, and I was quite shocked at that, that part, but uh, thank you, Annabel, for raising that as well. Uh, Alex Johnson also went on to say that uh, employment law should remain reserved to Westminster. And it was really quite strange because just after that, that's exactly what the Labour Party said and, and the sole Lib Dem said as well. That basically, it makes me think that Better Together is alive and kicking in these uh, other benches. And, you know, it's really rather quite sad when you think of the general election that they're still having it over that fact uh, better together rather than putting forward their constituents and their country's uh, interests as well. And I think the position of some of these parties regarding employment law, particularly, as Alison uh, Johnson has mentioned, it is devolved to Northern Ireland. So you often wonder, what is it that you won't do? Why won't you devolve these very important laws, as the SGC and others have asked for, to the Scottish Parliament to protect our own workers? Now, the only reason I can think of is, is because... Uh, in the, the SNP uh, government and also in the SGC, it basically says that uh, if we get that devolved, employment law devolved, we'll protect and promote the rights of workers in Scotland. I mean, I don't understand, particularly from the Labour benches. No, you wouldn't take one from me, sorry. I, I, I just don't understand, particularly the Labour Party will not want to protect the workers in Scotland. And, you know, I think Alison Johnson actually did sum up as well. Uh, it's a retrograde step, it's a negative step. So why won't you support a positive step forward? Surely we can lead the way in Scotland if we put forward... No, I'm sorry, I won't take an intervention. Surely we could lead the way in a positive step. And that's why I cannot understand for the life of me why the Labour Party in particular will not see this as a positive in in impact on not just in Scotland, but the rest of the UK. I mean... Perhaps if the Labour Party had listened to the people, they may be in power in Westminster instead of letting the Tories in in Westminster. Perhaps you should have listened to the people. And really it pains me, and lots of other people as well, that you pretend to be the party of the working people. You will not even support... So, no, I won't take an intervention. You won't even support... You won't even support employment law been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. As I said before, we could actually lead the way in employment law. Surely it's better to have a positive aspect than a negative aspect. So I do ask you to think carefully. I mean, you mentioned the fact about the Tories and the records that they have been. I have to say, I will pick up on Mike McKenzie's as well, about the Blair years, the Clause 4, what happened to the workers' rights under the Labour Party. So please don't come here in the piousness that the Labour Party are the ones... No, I won't take, no, I won't take an intervention. The piousness of the Labour Party who pretends to stick up for the working people. The working people have spoken. You had a chance to be elected as a government in Westminster and you wouldn't listen to the people and you let the Tories in. Ms. Thank White, you could you draw much. to a close the extra time I have is to reimburse interventions? Thank you. I, thank thank you. you. I'm drawn to a close. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I now call Elaine Murray to be followed by Richard Lyle. But I do let the Chamber know that I can reimburse interventions once again. I make that point. Mm -hmm. Elaine Murray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And like others, I welcome the opportunity to, to debate workers' rights this afternoon. Now, I can understand why the government wants to seek and doubtless will get parliamentary support for full and swift devolution of powers over employment law, given the discussions ongoing at Westminster on the Scotland Bill. But, as the Labour amendment acknowledges, there are differences of opinion regarding which parts of employment legislation should be de devolved and which parts should be reserved. Differences between individual trade unions, between the TUC and the STUC, and between individual members of trade unions, and indeed between individual members of the Labour Party. And I think we've heard some of those uh, discussions here already. And I suspect if the, if the Cabinet Secretary had really wanted to have a consensual debate, she would not have used full devolution of powers if you'd actually wanted to have a consensual debate because you knew that would not actually attract full support from, from, from the Labour Party. On, of course, on these benches, we aspired to a very different result to the general election last month. We hoped that across the UK, we could bring the minimum wage up to the living wage, that we could ban exploitative zero-hour contracts in all the constituent nations, that no firm anywhere would be able to exploit agency workers to undercut the wages of its permanent staff. We looked forward to being able to reward businesses who signed up to the living wage with tax rebates in the first year of our government. And we were determined to abolish the employment tri tribunal fee system, along with a package of wider reforms which would give employees proper act access to justice, along with a quicker resolution of cases, because we know those cases can drag out for years and years. But, as we know, instead we have a Tory government, which has the nerve, in my view, to describe itself as the party which represents working people but which proposes an out-and-out -out assault on the ability of working people yeah. to protect their rights by applying the ultimate sanction of withdrawing their labour. Having won the, the general election with little more than one-third of the votes cast, the Conservative government proposed to insist that trade unions must receive the votes of at least 50% of their membership before they can call a strike. You know, even the SNP last month didn't achieve the support from 50% of the Scottish electorate. These proposals, as the STUC have pointed out, will make it extremely difficult for a trade union to organise a legal strike. The benefits will accrue to bad employers. Those who use exploitative zero-hour contracts where workers don't know from one day to another whether they will have paid employment or how much. Those employers who grudgingly pay the minimum wage but no more. Those employers who bring in agency staff to undercut the, work, the wages of their regular staff. Employers, employers like these will benefit from the enormous barriers erected by the UK government uh, by this anti-trade union legislation. Working people will not benefit. Our amendment recognises the dilemma that faces many of us who support devolution but are deeply concerned about the direction of travel of the current UK government with regard to workers' rights and fair employment. On the one hand, I don't want to see workers anywhere in the UK being subject to worsening conditions of employment or being denied the right to take legitimate industrial action. I strongly believe in solidarity. And there are some matters which should very clearly should be devolved. We should be pressing, for example, for the devolution of employment tribunals. We have reformed our tribunal system in Scotland, and it would make sense for employment tribunals to be fully integrated into the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. And this would, of course, enable this Parliament to just scrap the unfair tri employment tribunals fees system. But, on the other hand, things have changed since the Smith Agreement was made. It was not, unfortunately, David Cameron who was locked out of Downing Street. It was the rest of us. We have different views, I am sure, as to why that happened. But none of that changes the result. So, maybe there is a case in these changed circumstances for consideration of greater devolution of employment law and the opportunity to de de demonstrate the advantages of better and fairer law by example. That debate, that recognition that we ought perhaps to go further than was originally uh, argued, should not, however, obscure the fact that we can do better even with the powers we have at the present time. There are, as others have said, injustices we can tackle now, even as we argue for de further devolved powers. Now, both Siobhan McMahon and Neil Finlay have spoken about the porters at Nine Mills and Royal Victoria Hospital in Dundee who have been taking industrial action over their pay grades since March. They have been graded at Band 1, while other porters working at other hospitals in the same health board have been graded as Band 2. They have offered to go to ACAS and other forms of arbitration, but NHS Tayside have refused, 
and have brought in volunteers, a different name for black, blackleg possibly, volunteers, and agency workers to cover their action. This is happening in the Scottish NHS. It's, uh, it's happening in health, which is totally devolved to this parliament. So there's no reason to us to hide behind powers we don't have. We could be looking at that here. Others have mentioned, Neil, I think, mentioned the National Museum strike. That's a strike which is happening within this government's responsibilities. And we could instigate a thorough inquiry into blacklisting in Scotland. We could call to account the construction firms which denied employment to workers for highlighting health and safety issues or for joining a trade union. Those employers should not be eligible for public sector contracts. We know this won't happen in England, but we can set the example here through the powers we have. We could promote health and safety in Scotland, even without the devolution of legislative power through the creation of Scotland, Scottish Hazard Centre to reduce work-related in illness, injury and death through the provision of information support and training. This would be a particular assistance to workers who don't benefit from being members of a trade union, but the centre would also promote the benefit of trade union membership. We could bring in things like legislation uh, uh, proposed by my colleague Hugh Henry on the protection of shop workers. There are many things we could do. We could investigate the historic injustices imposed on in striking minors during the strike 30 years ago and ensure that those who actually commanded the police officers are held to account, not just the police officers themselves. So let's not hide behind the powers we don't have. Whilst debating, correctly debating the arguments for further devolution, let's also make use of our present powers. And I think that's the lesson that we need to take forward. Let's have the debate. I am interested in hearing what people have to say and interested in hearing from all sides uh, what further powers should come here. But don't let's use that as an excuse for inaction on the things on, over which we do already have power. Thank you. Mr Lyle, can I just clarify that you still wish to contribute since your request to speak button seems to have gone oh, off? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Richard Lyle to be followed by uh, John Finney. I do apologise, uh, presiding officer, I didn't notice that. Um, thank you very much. Can I begin by complimenting Stuart Stevenson, MSP, on his historic 600th speech in the Chamber today. The protection and promotion of the rights and responsibilities of workers in Scotland should be a priority for all across this Chamber. That's why I believe that we should, like the Scottish Government and the STUC, share the view that as a priority, the UK Government should agree to the full devolution of powers over the minimum wage, trade union and employment law, health and safety law and equalities legislation, as well as further devolution of powers over Social Security. I am sure that we all want to see the Scottish Parliament have as many powers as we need to enable the Scottish Government to work effectively in partnership with trade unions, the third sector and business. This in order to boost economic growth, increase investment and support employment to deliver better jobs. And whilst we're on the topic of trade unions, let me say it clearly that I and these SNP benches oppose any Tory plans to restrict the right to strike and support trade unions with their proposals to modernise the way strike ballots are undertaken. Trade unions are a key social partner playing an important role in sustaining effective democracy in society, particularly at the workplace, and the existence of good employment practices are key to economic competitiveness and ultimately social justice. In recognition of this, the First Minister and the STUC have signed a new memorandum of understanding which recognises their shared priorities, including opposition to continued austerity and on further devolution. To that effect, the, Scottish, the First Minister held her first biannual meeting with the, the STUC Congress on the 13th of May. The STUC, the First Minister and all on these benches share the serious concerns over the impact on the people of Scotland of the UK Government's commitment to continued austerity, the additional £12 billion of cuts to Social Security spending and any further erosion of trade union and employment rights. We should through the actions I mentioned in my remarks today, seek to present an alternative and a voice which defends the rights of trade unions and those of employers across, employees across Scotland. Unlike the Conservative UK Government, the SNP Government led by example. And since the year, this year, 2011-12, the, 
the SNP Government have paid all the staff covered by the Scottish Government pay policy a living wage, including our very hard-working NHS staff. On this topic, the Scottish living wage has increased and benefiting people covered by the Scottish Government's pay policy, and that amounts to an increase of, of around £390 per year. Another essential aspect of employment and access to justice is the minimum wage. We back a minimum wage of 870 by 2020 and will support extending the measures to extend the living wage across the U United Kingdom. We back an increase in the minimum wage for under 21s and remove the, the apprentice rate and paying apprentices a fair wage. We call on and vote for the UK Government to pay all its employees the living wage, just as the SNP Government has done so. I personally believe, and this is my personal view, is that the minimum wage should be increased well before 2020 and put to a point, the higher we pay people, the more disposable income they have to spend, which contributes to our economy. And this also would actually reduce, I wonder why the Tories don't realise this, would reduce some families' dependency on certain benefits. A fair wage for a fair day's work. That's what I believe we should all be striving for and working to make this happen. The Scottish Government is committed to working in partnership with trade unions to promote fair work, the living wage, and have established the Fair Work Convention to take it forward. That also was announced by the First Minister on October 15, 2014, and aims to draw on and promote best practice while making it easier to work effectively with partners across the business community, third sector and trade unions. The Fair Work Convention will provide independent advice to the Scottish Government on matters relating to innovation, productivity workplaces, industrial relations, fair work, living wage in Scotland to support our objectives to reduce inequality, promote diversity and equality. This demonstrates the SNP Government's commitment to delivering change and working in partnership with trade unions. I, don't, I, don't, I do want to mention, however, that I know our SNP MPs will support action to make work fair, including ending unfair and exploitative zero-hours contracts. We lead by example, as the Scottish Government does not directly employ people on zero-hours contracts. And the Scottish Government have published guidance that it's practical for public purchasers and how they promote fair employment practices. This is in stark contrast, and this will wind them up, to the Labour Party who do not fulfil their words. And we only need to look at Glasgow City Council to see examples of this. To conclude, President Officer, so much is the SNP's commitment to ensuring... Yes, I might as well. Neil Finlay. I think he's right. There are councils of all persuasions who are employing people in zero-hours contract, just as there are thousands of workers employed in the NHS that is directly the responsibility of the Scottish Government. This is a problem that is endemic throughout uh, work and life in Scotland. That is the issue that we have to get to grips with. And please don't take a holier-than-thou attitude about anyone because it is endemic throughout our uh, working system. Richard Lyle. Well, at the end of the day, we have to ensure that people, as I said earlier in my speech, President Officer, people get a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And, and I have always uh, tried to ensure that anyone who worked for me or under me has always had that, that, that situation. To conclude, President Officer, so much of the SNP's commitment to ensuring the protection of employees' rights and access to justice that the SNP's trade union group alone has more members than the Scottish Labour Party. The SNP's trade union group has increased to more than 15,000 members. This goes in hand with the huge growth of the SNP, as more and more people realise that we are the party of the working people in Scotland, and no longer the Labour Party represent people, uh, working people in Scotland. These voices, along with the well over 100,000 SNP members, will campaign and work tirelessly along with Scotland's 56 new SNP MPs to deliver the powers promised to Scotland, and I very much look forward to the powers over employment law coming to this Parliament in order for us in this place to deliver for Scotland's workers.
Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. The last open debate speaker is John Finney, and I can give you some extra time if you care to take interventions, Mr Finney. Okay, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. President Officer, I had the great pleasure last Friday of addressing the PCS AGM in Glasgow and uh, a fine bunch of people. And, uh, an extra pleasure was the, being asked to present an award to Louise McBain. Louise works uh, for Borden and Gallic at uh, Great Glen House in Inverness, and she was given an award as a young um, uh, trade unionist for the level of recruitment she had done in the 70s per cent. So, at the good fortune at the end of that to, to have a, a talk with uh, Louise, a wee bit in Gaelic, a wee bit in English, and it transpires that that figure was wrong. She's actually recruited up to 90 per cent of the staff at Great Glen House. And the significance of that is uh, I pick up on the points that Gordon MacDonald made in his speech, and that is about the collaborative nature of the workforce that that will bring about. And that will bring about good relations. It doesn't, by the very nature of people being engaged in trade unionism, suggest fractious workplace. Quite the reverse. Matters can be resolved. And, uh, a number of members have made mention of the museum staff. Of course, as PCS members are the museum staff, and PS, PCS have been representing them very ably, and, and I hope that we do see a resolution in that, and I would urge the Scottish Government to redouble their efforts for uh, intervening there. Likewise, uh, people have mentioned the porters in Dundee, and I'm inherently suspicious of any employer who's got an unwillingness to engage with ACAS. Indeed, employees won't be allowed access to tribunal without having exhausted all internal mechanisms. So um, I think it's very important that we're not in any way complacent here. Our basis for discussing and, and indeed welcoming um, trade union rights is the very foundation laid out by my colleague Al Al Alison Johnston, who talked about the relationship between all the various human rights. And I'm, uh, uh, I think that should be the basis of... Um, our approach to everything in our policy making. I support the Scottish Government motion. I support the devolution of powers, not simply employment powers, um, but a whole range of powers. And why do I support that? Because I actually think we can do things better. I like the wording of the motion. I like the word protection. And what is that protection? It's protection of hard fought for rights. A lot of people put a great deal of effort into winning these rights, many brave individuals. I like the word promotion, because there's not many people seem very keen in promoting workers' rights. I think that's a very, very positive uh, uh, um, a word to associate with this particular subject. Um, I hope that the devolution of employment rights would not just bring about the protection. I want to see an enhancement, and I think there's an opportunity to improve workers' terms and conditions, and, and I think the debates that are ongoing are very important. Um, the minimum threshold for strikes um, has been covered by many speakers. There are a number of issues when you get to this stage of the debate, of course. And, and there does seem to be some rank hypocrisy in uh, the part of the UK Prime Minister. Nothing new in relation to that, of course. Um, I'm, I'm drawn to the words of Graeme Smith, the General Secretary of the STUC, who talks who, in relation to the proposal, says, effectively banning the right to take industrial action in the UK. What a retrograde step that is. And he goes on to say that, indeed, that's some of the weakest legal protections in the developed world for workers, a damning indictment in where we've got to in terms. So I would ask whose interests are served by this, and it's certainly not the people of Scotland's interests who are served by this, and it's certainly not wider uh, workers' interests. Um, as I've said, I, I really believe that trade union staff associations play a positive role in the workplace. Uh, um, it's a preventative rather than a cure that it's there. Good working relationships are uh, good for business and, and uh, productivity. Um, and events reach employment tribunals because there's been a failure to, to operate these systems. So um, the role of ACAS is very important. Now, the word disincentive is used in relation to the changes that have been taking place in relation to employment tribunals and who in their right mind is going to spend uh, a sum of money, a fee, in an attempt to recoup half that sum of money in holiday pay, for instance. It's ridiculous. So uh, on one level, if we'd been debating different subjects and I had seen that there was an 85% drop in sex discrimination cases, a 50% drop in race cases and a 47% drop in disability cases, that would be a cause for rejoicing. But as has been said, this is brought about by the situation that people are having to weigh up whether their moral and legal position is worth the expenditure. Uh, and clearly, um, it's in the interests of people who have bad work practices that these fees continue. So the term access to justice is frequently banded about in this chamber, not just in relation to this debate, but in relation to a lot of other um, matters too. And it's clear that workers are not gaining access to justice as a result of these changes. And citizens' advice have been mentioned, and we know that these are the very people who will pick up many of the issues, as we all do in our, our workplace uh, there. Alec Johnson mentioned EU-wide benefits. Um, and, uh, of course, the UK government 
is supportive of TTIP. My colleague Alison Johnson referred to that. That will be a race to the bottom, not simply in workers' rights, but in terms of environmental rights. Um, and uh, free trade seems to be the, 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 uh, the rationale that's used to lend support to this. Well, of course, um, it will be a race to the bottom, as we've seen in experiences elsewhere. So I, I think we, we watch that one with, with alarm. With trade unions, the term unity of strength uh, um, is, is uh, often used. Well, of course, there's unity um, among the multinational corporations and those who subscribe to this neoliberal agenda. And uh, St Stuart Stevenson touched on that when he talked about a, a, a human rights approach involving carers. And I think carers are a very important part of our community. Um, health and safety. And again, the Westminster Prime Minister refers to that as the monster. And it's a monster that he wants to uh, uh, slay. Uh, the tactic of ridicule and misrepresentation is terribly important. A number of people have talked on workplace deaths. We saw the 25th anniversary of uh, Piper Alpha disaster commemorated in many ways, but the most shameful way it was commemorated was by the change to the offshore regime that was put in place by the UK government. Um, and what that is, is a, a green light for dangerous workplace activities. And workplace activities that don't just simply impact on the workforce, of course, they will impact on the, the wider um, community as well. Uh, the health and safety executive has been removed of any opportunity for a degree of proactivity and I'm sure that devolution of that would go a long way um, because of the priorities. Politics is about priorities and we would make a priority uh, to uh, ensure that our workers and our workplaces were safe places. So I commend colleagues who have talked about a number of issues. I commend those who have talked about blacklisting. I think that's a vile practice. It's a very, very pernicious um, element that's gone through the United Kingdom there. The umbrella companies, again, another very, very sad and damning indictment in our, in our. The issue of corporate manslaughter is something that must be picked up on. People have talked about both the government bill and Patricia Ferguson's members bill covering fatal accidents, and I think they're getting a lot of scrutiny at the moment. I think it's very important that we're not complacent about the workplace in Scotland as it is. There are issues around our modern apprenticeships regarding gender uh, and, and race and disability, the under, level of underrepresentation there. I welcome the Scottish Government and STUC's memo of understanding. I, I wonder if biannual meetings are sufficient. Um, um, I, I think that what we need to do is see a rights-based approach to everything. So the Fair Work Convention will go some way to that. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Many thanks. That then brings us to the closing speeches, and I call on Annabelle Goldie. Maximum eight minutes, please. Uh, Presiding officer, thank you very much indeed. This has been a useful debate, which particularly, as the Cabinet Secretary sagely observed, has contrasted two approaches, her party's and mine, with some flourishes from the Labour Party on the benches opposite. <clears throat> Presiding officer, to me, the two priorities for any government in relation to employment are to create the economic conditions necessary to underpin and support increasing employment and to support responsible practices and positive relationships in the workplace. Now that, of course, in turn places obligations on both employers and employees to ensure the workplace is one of mutual respect. And where such good relations exist, there will be a benefit both to the workforce and to the economy. It is the case that we have over two centuries moved from a situation where workers needed protection and didn't have it to a situation in the latter part of the last century where incessant industrial action brought businesses to their knees, paralysed the economy and indeed sought to interfere with the role of democratic government. Now, neither extreme is either justifiable or sustainable and reforms were enacted to attempt to rebalance rights and responsibilities. And I have to say, uh, presiding officer, today, I did hear echoes of returning to practices that I know have now been abandoned by most modern competitive economies. And in amongst the rhetoric and in amongst the passion of political debate, all of which is admirable and necessary, I do hope uh, members will pause to look at what is working elsewhere and reflect on why, what might be unwise to contemplate for either Scotland or the United Kingdom. It is a fact, presiding officer, businesses do not have to operate in either the UK or Scotland. And an industrial relations framework which does not balance the rights of trade unions with those of hard-working taxpayers, and that's inclusive. Hard-working taxpayers are people who may find themselves 
uh, unable to get to work, uh, obstructed in trying to get to work because of industrial action, which, as I'll mention in a moment or two, may not actually have uh, a democratic mandate from within the trade union. But we... I'm just finishing a point, Mr Stevenson. If, if these practices are permitted, they will present an unattractive environment to business and it will impair the creation of jobs. And that's not just the observation of me as a politician. That is actual fact. In a highly competitive global economy, businesses are mobile. And so if that balance and if that test of reasonableness are not in evidence, businesses will not be encouraged to stay. And I have to say, presiding officer, when strikes are... When strikes are possible, not at the moment, when in one case 16% of the trade union membership voted, of whom 11% wanted to strike, then frankly I think it's difficult to argue against some form of change. Introducing a threshold for strikes, introducing a threshold for strike decisions in key public services, um, and a 50% turnout threshold for strike ballots to ensure there is a real mandate, I think is necessary. Now, it means that there will... Just give me a moment, please. It means there will be less disruption from strikes where union leaders have not even persuaded a majority of their own members um, to vote. And I'm happy to give way... I think Mr Stevenson was first and then... Mr uh, Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to pick up the democratic mandate point, and I'd just pick a reference I made in my speech to the Human Rights uh, Convention, which the UK signed up to in the 1950s. That's an international treaty. Do you think that should be subject to leaving that the same basis that there is on the proposals for affecting trade union rights and ballots? Or should some other number prevail? Or is it just trade unions that are being singled out for a very special mandate, wholly at odds with any other mandate that there is? I expected an intervention, not a treatise on um, international law. I don't think the member is quite in point with what I'm trying to uh, argue for. Uh, on the whole um, threshold of human rights, uh, contrary to what may have been represented in the Chamber, my party does not propose to and would have no intention of abolishing human rights. It simply wants to recodify the very strong basis of our human rights, which we are already bound by under international law, but which is in need of, of reform. No, Mr Finlay, your colleague was first. Drew Smith. I apologise to uh, Mr Finlay, but I thank uh, Ms Goldie. Um, I mean, the argument she makes around business moving around, of course, just creates a race to the bottom around the world. But on this specific point uh, about uh, trade union ballots, we would all want to see uh, more people engaged in any form uh, of ballot. But why don't the UK government then for bring forward measures which would make it easier um, for people to take part and participate in industrial democracy, such as online voting, rather than putting further barriers in the way of industrial democracy? I'm Bill Quilty. It may surprise the member. I'm not, in fact, totally unsympathetic to the point he's making, but I think there are separate issues of what the legal framework should be for industrial action and what may be very welcome, legitimate and innovative practices for unions to pursue to facilitate their, their members taking part in, in ballots. And I think there are two separate issues um, there. Uh, presiding officer, on devolution... No, thanks, Mr Finley. I've been generous. On devolution um, of employment law, there was no compelling case made to the Smith Commission um, uh, in support of such a move, and um, it was not part of the all-party Smith Commission agreement. And if my recollection is correct, there were many... Um, troubling observations made about what the effect of devolution of employment law, the creation of different employment regimes, um, could mean for both the stability of business and the stability of the employment base within Scotland. So it will not surprise the Cabinet Secretary that my party does not support her view in that. I have to say, presiding officer, that the Cabinet Secretary's motion hardly reads like a charter of business strength and job creation because it does restrict itself to the rights of employees and the obligations of employers, a theme echoed by many contributors to the debate. And yet, Having been, and I realise I'm probably in the minority in this in this chamber, having been an employer myself and responsible for staff issues, I know it is mutual respect and regular dialogue in the workplace which creates the most stable platform 
for good relations, a partnership between employer and employee. And can I make clear, I think trade unions have actually a very important role to play in that function. A role that extends beyond industrial relations. Um, trade unions can be an invaluable source of advice. They can be an invaluable source of information about training or how to improve practices in the workplace. And that is all to be welcomed. Very few members alluded to some interesting models already existing, presiding officer, on other forms of employee engagement, whether that's through um, staff or work councils, whether it's through other models such as cooperative and workers' trusts, or whether it's through employee ownership trusts, or, for example, the recently constructed um, um, employee shareholders where employees are encouraged to um, have a financial interest in the business. I'm a very strong advocate of all of that. I think it makes for a strong business entity. Could you draw to a close, please? Can I say in conclusion, presiding officer, that I think there are many positive initiatives taking place, and I wish the Fair Work Convention well in its endeavours to build on all of that. It has an opportunity to think outside the box. But one word of caution. It should remember business operates against a razor edge of global competition, and we must leave businesses free to make essential commercial decisions. I support the amendment in my colleague's name. Thank you very much. And I now call on Hugh Henry. Maximum 10 minutes, please. Okay. Thank you, President Officer. Richard Lyle, in his contribution, I think probably rightly, um, made the point about why so many working people, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, have turned their backs on uh, the Labour Party and decided to vote for other parties. It's an entirely reasonable point, and it does point to a failure of the Labour Party, and one which those of us who are members of the Labour Party uh, do need to reflect on. And he said, again quite rightly, pointed out that many working people in Scotland are now supporting the SNP because they seem to think that what the SNP has to say on many issues um, chimes at the moment with uh, what, 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 what they feel. But, you know, if you are going to talk about history and pedigree and what's in the DNA of political parties, then yes, it's right to chastise us that in many respects over the years we have moved away from our roots, that maybe we have neglected some of the people um, who we, we should have been uh, working for. But equally, I suppose, so that was in our, our DNA and, and that has been our history, our tradition, our heritage and our roots. But equally, I would then suggest that maybe at some point um, we do need to reflect on the history, DNA, heritage and, and pedigree of the SNP. Because the SNP hasn't always been a party which has stood up for workers' rights and for the interests of ordinary working people. That wasn't what drove... Gordon Wilson. It wasn't what drove William Wilfe. It wasn't what drove Arthur Donaldson because they had a different tradition, a different outlook in life and different aims. And at the moment, yes, it so happens that much of what the SNP is saying coincides with what many ordinary working people are saying. But that's not the be-all uh, and end-all for the SNP because we know that their ultimate aim is not the rights of working people but it is about independence and that's a fair enough point um, to make. Now, no thanks. I thought that Elaine Murray's speech was probably the best speech of the afternoon because she actually posed a, a number of challenges and raised a number of issues. And, and I think she put it in the correct context. The, the debate about whether or not we devolve employment law or more powers has got to be taken from a perspective of what will actually improve the lot of ordinary men, women and children in Scotland. It's not powers for power's sake. And I think that there is an argument to be made that if we can demonstrate that additional powers on some of the issues which have, have been raised this afternoon, if that argument can be made, then I think it's one that's, that, that's worthy of some 
detailed consideration. Yes, I think as many speakers have pointed out this afternoon, uh, you know, from starting with the Cabinet Secretary and right through the debate, that what's happening in relation to employment tribunals is a disgrace because a function and a facility that was established to help ordinary people exercise their rights has now been turned in to an impenetrable barrier for those ordinary people when they seek to exercise their rights. And I can't remember who it was, but, but someone used, I thought, a very opposite phrase that it, it was actually getting to the situation effectively that people couldn't afford to be able to exercise the rights which they, they have been granted. So, yes, I think that we should look at uh, that carefully. Uh, the, the issue has been made by Elaine and, and, and Murray and others about the right to strike. And it, and it is a democratic absurdity that you can have a government elected to affect the lives of each and every one of us on the basis of a third or less of the total electorate, but yet they seem to want to demand that when it comes to trade unions, that trade unions should have 50% of their members uh, voting for, for action. There are inconsistencies, there are contradictions, and frankly, um, it's, it's hypocrisy, but we actually know that it's there for a reason and for a purpose. It's not there by accident, certainly. Neil Finlay. Annabel Goldie in her speech mentioned democratic mandate. I wonder if Mr Henry can help me in establishing what democratic mandate Baroness Goldie of Bishopton has for sitting in a legislature. Hugh Henry. Well, I think Annabel Goldie has the same right to sit here as Neil Finlay does, so <laughs> I don't think that we should necessarily um, go, down, go down that route. So, you know, th th there are issues... Um, like the, the, the right to strike that, that, that do need to be addressed. Um, and, you know, Siobhan McMahon and others spoke about uh, the hazard centre and um, aspects of, of, of life where people do need the support of legislatures, whether it's here, Westminster, or indeed in, in Europe. But, you know, a number of porters, uh, sorry, a number of, of, of speakers also pointed to the difference between demanding more powers for the sake of them, and then turning our backs on the use of powers that we already had. Now, Mike McKenzie, in his contribution, talked about aspiration and lack of ambition. Well, do you know something? Poverty of ambition. There is a poverty of ambition and a lack of aspiration when it comes to refusing to use the powers that we have to do something about the blacklisting inquiry that Neil Finlay has been campaigning for. There is something about a poverty of ambition and aspiration when, you know, on, on, on behalf of many trade unionists, I bring forward legislation to give protection in the workplace to those who are assaulted and the Scottish Government decides not to act. There is a poverty of ambition when it comes to using the powers that we have in uh, purchasing um, to insist that contractors pay the living wage, to do what Renfrewshire Council, my own council, does, using its funds to insist that those who contract with the council actually pay the living wage. The Scottish Government could do that just now. There is a poverty of ambition when it comes to dealing with some of the issues, for example, that Richard Baker has been addressing. There is a poverty of ambition when it comes to looking at using um, our, our powers to have an inquiry into the conviction of minors who were taking uh, strike action all those years ago in 1984. So there are things that we could and we should be doing. So let's not sneer at others about a poverty of ambition when we often display that same poverty of ambition here. And that also comes on very practical and immediate issues, like the porters in NHS Tayside. Don't tell me, no thank you Mr McKenzie, don't tell me that the Cabinet Secretary for Health, who represents a Dundee constituency, 
will not be listened to by the Chief Executive of NHS Tayside and by the senior managers there. She has power, she has influence, but there is a poverty of ambition doing anything to help those porters who are taking strike action. They won't even allow them to go to ACAS. Now, the other point that um, Elaine Murray um, had raised you know, in, in, in looking at some of these things is that how appropriate is it and what could we do with powers? Now, there's not much of what Alec Johnson says that I would agree with, but you know, he, he did make the point um, about, um, about wanting to avoid a race to the bottom. And one of the things that we do need to be careful about is in demanding powers and taking decisions that could have unintended consequences. So, for example, if we have the power to legislate on things like the living wage, the minimum wage and, and other things, do we then encourage some ruthless employers to move their, their business from Scotland to England if there are lower wage employers, uh, employment rights and if there are less legal protection. Mr so, Henry, you must draw to a close. I'll finish, I'll finish in this, presiding officer. So we need to avoid unintended consequences and that's why we need a debate, yes, with the STUC, but also with the TUC and with the trade unions across the length and breadth of the United Kingdom to make sure that whatever we do is in the best interest of working people wherever they are. Many thanks. I now call on Annabelle Ewing to wind up. Minister, you have until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And this has been an important uh, debate this afternoon because it has focused on what I think are really key issues which uh, concern the fairness, uh, dignity and equality uh, for those seeking work uh, and for those in work. Uh, and I think it has been referred to already uh, this afternoon, presiding officer, that the most recent research uh, finds growing evidence that inequality is harmful for long-term economic growth. Indeed, the latest publication by the OECD entitled In It Together, Why Less Inequality Benefits All, presents evidence on the malign economic consequences of inequality. Of course, it should be recognised that income inequality is not just a UK problem. However, the report does highlight that the problem of inequality uh, is regrettably worse in the UK than in most other OECD member states. The report also uh, recommends uh, pursuing policies that are both growth and equality friendly, including the establishment of good working practices, employment promotion and the creation of good quality jobs. I would suggest, therefore, that it is indeed a scandal that the UK government plans to introduce measures which will only make the situation wor worse. Uh, as Graeme Smith, the General Secretary of the STUC, has said, and I quote, the attack on employment and trade union rights will further undermine workplace democracy and leave Scottish workers with some of the weakest legal protections in the developed world. I agree, Presiding Officer, with the Secretary General uh, the General Secretary, rather, of the STUC. Uh, and I would say uh, that uh, in this debate, what we need to do is to call quite clearly for the UK government to address the issues raised rather than attacking the rights of workers in a second, to devote, uh, to devolve uh, power over employment law uh, and wages and health and safety to allow this parliament to improve the rights of workers and improve their protections. And indeed, to listen to the people of Scotland who have made it quite clear that it is not to be business as usual in Westminster following the Westminster general election. I give way. Alec Johnson. With almost as few as one in four of Britain's workers now a member of a trade union, is the minister correct to conflate trade union membership with workers' rights and think the two are interchangeable? Minister. Uh, I wonder uh, if uh, the level of the ratio of, of uh, membership of trade unions in Scotland nonetheless still exceeds the membership of the Conservative Party uh, in Scotland, and that may be something uh, he would wish to reflect upon in his uh, uh, thesis uh, there, presiding officer. Um, there have been a number of um, important uh, themes emerging from the uh, debate today. But before uh, getting into the nitty-gritty and trying to respond as far as I can within the time I have to various points raised, members can always write to me afterwards if I don't get round to them. I, I would just say, uh, in response to Mr Henry, who never fails to disappoint in his uh, winding up uh, speeches, uh, that, the, that, what the SNP, that what the SNP does recognise, Mr Henry, is at its heart 
Politics is about people and it is about dignity. And perhaps, just perhaps, that is why the people of Scotland put their trust in the SNP as a majority government in 2011. And maybe just that's why the people of Scotland voted 56 out of 59 Westminster MPs. And maybe that's just why the recent TNS poll put support for the SNP at 60%. I give way. Hugh Henry. President Officer, I don't deny that. I accepted the fact that I think largely the Labour Party has failed ordinary working people in this country and that what the SNP uh, was saying to them chimed more with their aspirations. I, I, I didn't say anything different. Minister. Uh, well, except we had a wee detour around criticising uh, uh, particular individuals. But in any event, moving on, uh, presenting officer, we have important... Um, we have important um, uh, issues to, to deal with in terms of trying to respond to, to points raised. Uh, obviously, uh, a number of speakers spoke about the uh, employment uh, tribunals and the uh, uh, imposition of fees uh, for employment tribunals and the effect by the UK government and the impact, the negative impact that has had on uh, uh, access to justice on the part of uh, workers. Uh, and uh, as a, the Minister for uh, Women's Employment, I am particularly concerned that the most significant drop in claims has been for those concerning sex discrimination. Uh, indeed, I think it was Christina McKelvey who pointed out that the, uh, the drop in, in the number of claims recorded since the introduction of fees with regard to such claims was in the region of 83-84%. That really is a, a shocking statistic and it has obviously had a disproportionate effect on women uh, at work. Uh, with the devolution of employment tribunals, we will be able to engage with our stakeholders and the public to explore innovative ways to improve access to employment tribunals and to ensure that awards made at an employment tribunal are in fact enforced. Another important point has been uh, made by many speakers this afternoon. Um, we indeed have heard that uh, some 49% of those with successful claims do not actually get their award, and that is just uh, not on. Uh, so, uh, in fact, presiding officer, there are many issues uh, if we had the power to deal with employment tribunals so that we could uh, progress. Uh, at the moment, achieving justice through the tribunal system has become something of a lottery, and that is simply uh, not acceptable. Again, in terms of what is to be devolved, there is a, a lack of clarity uh, uh, in terms of what the UK government is proposing, and we need to urgently uh, uh, determine what I'd exactly is... I'd be grateful if the chatter could cease so that we could hear the Minister, yeah. please. Thank you, President Officer. We need clarity as to what exactly is being devolved in terms of fees, procedure rules, and so on. Another important issue, of course, raised uh, was the issue of the Trade Union Bill, and many members have spoken out quite uh, forcibly about the uh, unfairness uh, at the very heart of that bill and indeed have compared quite rightly the issues concerning uh, mandate uh, and uh, 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 thresholds with the uh, position that the UK Conservative So just government a moment, could members entering the chamber show some courtesy to the Minister please? Minister. Thank you. I uh, have compared, obviously, the position of the UK Conservative Party with the issues of mandate and threshold because, of course, I think it was Gordon MacDonald who said that at the moment the, uh, the votes secured by the Conservative government uh, in the UK Parliament represent 24% of the electoral roll. So I think they would have a hard job in getting up to the 50% that they see as necessary for trade unions. Um, other issues, important issues raised, uh, obviously, concern a, a number of, of key uh, uh, denuding of workers' rights in the form of blacklisting, umbrella contracts, the failure to pay the living wage. And many speakers have, have suggested that somehow um, we can, absent employment law powers, absent the power to do something, that we can wave a magic wand and that somehow employment law powers are not really that important. They kind of sit to one side of this debate, whereas they are part and parcel, they are fundamental to what we can actually do. We are in the business of wanting to actually make the lives of workers better. I don't know what Labour these days are in the business of wanting to do. They've talked about, uh, you know, complexity. They've talked about, oh, well, maybe not all powers. They've talked about... Uh, you know, companies would leave Scotland if we had proper rights for workers. Well, I find these comments from a Labour Party, particularly presiding officer, very uh, strange uh, indeed. Um, we've also talked about the inquiry for blacklisting. Um, I think uh, in a recent debate, Mr Finlay had the opportunity to make several points to the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Infrastructure. I think a meeting was offered. Mr Finlay isn't listening. I don't know if that meeting has been <laughs> arranged. Order, um, please. Could all members please pay attention to the closing remarks? Um, in terms of zero hours contracts, again, many speakers uh, uh, made uh, very important points about zero hours contracts. Again, 
these are issues that if we had power over employment law, we could actually do something tangible about. That is what the people of Scotland want us to do. Uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, because I'm not quite sure where I am, um, I've got a minute, I'm told by the Cabinet Secretary, um, what I would say uh, is that this okay. has been um, a, a, an important debate. It has been um, not exactly cuddly, uh, to use that unknown word in the Chamber, but nonetheless, I think it has been important for members to hear uh, the arguments in favour of actually what devolving powers of employment law would mean. And that Keep is going. what we want in this side of the chamber to happen, because that is the way that we can improve the lives of workers uh, in this uh, country. Um, uh, we have heard today of many uh, successes where we have actually been able to use the levers of power that we currently have. We have secured over 200 living wage accredited employers. Uh, I would also like to say in response to Annabel Goldie that of course we have pursued the business pledge which is uh, a shared mission as between the government and business in Scotland to uh, uh, promote a fair work agenda which is good for workers' rights, but it's also, of course, good for business and good for the economy. And I would just like to report to the Chamber that Microsoft were the latest uh, company to sign up to the Scottish Business Pledge today. Mm -hmm. So it just shows you that if you have the will, you can make progress. But in order to really make the crucial difference that we want to see in the employment landscape in Scotland, we must have the necessary powers to do so. Finally, presiding officer, like the TUC, we want these powers here in our parliament to protect and to promote the rights of workers. And it says it all really about the state of the Labour Party in Scotland today, that in the end of the day, they are content, they are content for the Tories at oh, Westminster dear. to have powers over employment rights rather than this democratically elected parliament in Scotland. Shame on them, presiding officer. <laughs> Thank you. That concludes the debate on protecting employee rights and access to justice. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business, and I would remind members that in relation to this afternoon's debate, if the amendment in the name of Siobhan McMahon is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Alex Johnston falls. The first question, then, is that amendment 13442.2 in the name of Siobhan McMahon, which seeks to amend motion number 13442 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on protecting employee rights and access to justice be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. Therefore, we will move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now, please. The result of the vote on amendment number 13442.2 in the name of Siobhan McMahon is yes, 31, no, 78. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. That then brings us to the next question, which is that amendment 13442.3 in the name of Alex Johnston, which seeks to amend motion number 13442 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on protecting employee rights and access to justice, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote. Please cast your votes now. Order the result of the vote on amendment number 13442.3 in the name of Alex Johnston is as follows. Yes, 13. 
No 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion 13442 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on protecting employee rights and access to justice be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division. Please cast your votes now. Order the result of the vote on motion number 13442 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham is as follows. Yes, 60. No, 18. There were 31 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting of Parliament.